okay so thank thank you for coming in such large numbers i guess you have no choice but <laughs> i will try to make your two hours the best two hours in your life why am i calling this a crash course because whatever i am going to show it's not just a ppt i'll be showing lot of demos very fast you may not even be able to catch up but just understand the concept you don't go into the nitty gritty so if i show you something and you don't understand what exactly did i do operationally that's not important what is important to understand the concept awareness about something being present is more important than the operational skill once you know something exists you are smart enough to use it when the need arises so everything which i show is getting recorded i will upload that video on my youtube channel tomorrow so you can refer to it as well so you don't have to take detailed notes you can just take few notes but everything is getting recorded as a video okay so let's dive straight into it few things i am going to talk about office i only talk about office a quick uh, introduction just to show you what i do i have been doing this for almost 30 years now i am not going to read this out what is that noise is that normal okay so that is the introduction that's not very important what is important is to understand that today i'm going to show you how to use something which you have always been using called office so how many of you are workers just raise your hands even in brainstorm i can see you how many are workers okay so whether you have workers or not you have used office word excel powerpoint outlook maybe one not what i am trying to tell you is whatever you are doing in that context of using office you are absolutely inefficient and you are not alone the entire world is with you even people who have been using it for decades are also inefficient in it why nobody wants to be inefficient people are inefficient because we have never paid attention to it we use it by trial and error when something works we assume the method i have found is the only method and the best method we have never tried to optimize the process so i will show you how to use it better because let everyone else be inefficient you become efficient that's your competitive advantage okay so let's start with one drive i don't know how many of you use it how many use one drive okay that's good so what is one drive one drive is like google drive dropbox box any kind of cloud storage now why do we use it we use one drive because we should always store files which you create never only on the local hard disk because that can fail or there can be a virus attack and it can get destroyed so always store your files on one drive of course you can use any cloud storage but as we go along you will understand that because one drive is created by microsoft and microsoft also created office the integration between the two is amazing and you can exploit that to your advantage how do you store a file on one drive it's very simple when you go to file save as typically for 20 years or whatever number of years you are using office for our brain or rather our spinal cord is used to clicking here so it requires lot of courage to remember next time never to click on this guy go here in your case it will be a personal version of one drive which is okay if you don't have one drive go to onedrive.com login create a new login if you want it's free it will give you 7 or 15 gb free that's good enough and once you save it there what happens let me show you that so that's the next topic why should we store it there now what happens is very often we work on a file we forget to save something crashes and the file goes for a toss it gets corrupted and all your effort is lost that will never happen now let me show you so i have a file here what happens i hope all of you can see um uh, on top you will see there is the file name right now what am i doing right now i am just changing something in the file i am trying to zoom in so that everyone can see that is the file name this is just text what am i doing in this text i made it red in color 
just that much it will automatically save you never have to manually say save that's the point it will auto save whether you are using a laptop on desktop browser mobile phone or a tablet doesn't matter it will auto save all office files so no more file corruption now sometimes what happens we have a file we delete something if we do something by mistake what do we do control z undo very good now if you have done some change saved the file closed the file and or reopened the file undo doesn't work so what happens in that case if you have no other copy of the file you are stuck because you lose those changes so now let me show you what happens so this file i have edited many times in past now if you look at the file name and that is what i was trying to show you if i make any change it will start saving that dot 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 means it's saving there is no space to show it not only that it gives you another important feature so i'm going to close the file and uh, reopen it now what do i get i get something called automatic versioning what does that mean let me show you so now it's saying the file is saved if i make any change it will save the file again so i'm just making it bold it will save again like that now once this is done it gives you automatic version history normally we are used to saving file save as version 1 version 2 manually you don't need to do that at all once you start using it it gives you automatic versions that's another benefit of using one drive so let's go ahead now whenever you want to share a file with someone today we send as an attachment in the process what happens two copies get created three 20 copies get created each copy is edited by someone else then someone has to send those files to you and then you have to copy paste copy paste copy paste that's a total waste of time so what should we do we should never send files as attachments if it is possible what should you do in that case if you can't send files as attachment what do you do there is a share button here go to share choose whichever uh, one drive you have in this case i have corporate whether it is personal or corporate doesn't really matter and once you say share it will give you various options you can just create a link and mail that link choose the names of people any person from outside hotmail id gmail id is also okay so you just say specific people and then specify the name of the person and that's it what will happen when i say send a mail is still going to go but that mail will not have the file we just have the link that person can open the file edit the file and you will automatically get the latest copy while that person is editing the file you can also edit the file at the same time all changes will be merged automatically there will be no conflict normally when we store a file on a file share if someone is editing other person can't edit they'll get an error that will not happen there is no limit 20 people can also edit the same file so suppose as a group you have to present something what should you do create one file put it on one drive share it with your team and everyone can edit it not necessarily on a laptop it can be on mobile tablet browser anywhere all of them will work beautifully so that eliminates unwanted copies this i have already talked about let me see if i can show it to you so now this is the file name when i open it it shows me version history for so many times i have edited the file automatically it has stored the versions you don't have to say save you don't have to say save version it's all automatic <coughs> so if i want to go to a older version i can say open the version and then it will show me older version i can restore it in case i made a mistake or compare it it's very easy and very effective 
Okay, let's go further. Now, as I said, OneDrive as an application is available on mobile as well, Android as well as iOS, tablets, everywhere. Same way, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote are also available as mobile apps. So, make sure you install all the mobile apps. I'll tell you how to do that later. But all of these can be used for editing and viewing the documents. Alright, so that's the only thing I'm going to talk about OneDrive. How to get OneDrive, I will tell you later. Now let's go to Excel. I hope all of you use Excel to some extent. Right. So, first thing in Excel. When you create an Excel file, three sheets get created. That's stupid. Very often we never use the sheet 2 and sheet 3. It doesn't occupy space, but it confuses you. Six months later, you don't even remember does sheet 1, sheet 2, sheet 3, which one has what. You don't even give them names. So, this is what you do. Next time you open Excel, do this. Go to File. In the File menu, go to the last thing called Options. In Options, you will see an Options. When you create a new workbook, how many sheets should be there? By default, it is 3, make it 1. That does not reduce anything. You can add up to 255 sheets, but unnecessarily creating two extra sheets is a waste. So stop that. It's very simple, but useful. Okay, that's very simple. Let's go to something else. How many times have you seen green marks in Excel? Let me show you what I mean by that. Here is an Excel file. I'm keeping things very simple, and the same concept applies to complex files. I have just four cells containing data. I have one formula which is summing all the four cells and another formula which is summing only Jan, Feb, March because I want only Q4 total. So now notice what happens. When I add next month's data, the formula is not going to change. Right now I remember to change the formula but if the formula is far away, it's a file someone else has sent me, I don't even know where the formulas are. So I may forget to update the formula. The formula is still showing 40, correct? It should have been much more, 96. Now if someone only looks at the formula and assumes the number is correct, that's wrong. That's called operational risk. Because people trust numbers in Excel without cross-checking. That is the biggest problem with not just Excel, any spreadsheet. But Excel is the only spreadsheet which understands that this number is inaccurate. So that's why it shows these green marks. When you see a green mark in Excel, please don't ignore it. That's a risk mitigation methodology. You must go to each green mark, open it, see what it is telling you. It's actually understood that you are omitting some cells. So now, when you say update formula, notice what it does. Right now, the formula is still D10. When I say update formula, it automatically changes it. Even if this formula is far away in another sheet, this will work fine. So all that you have to do is look at every green mark and correct it. Now this green mark, I don't want to say update because I still want Q4. So whether to say update or ignore is your discretion and you should apply cell by cell. So how do you know where these green marks are? Go to formula tab and error checking. This is like spell check. Excel knows where the errors are. It will find those errors one by one and then once it finds the error, it's your call whether you want to update or ignore. So you have to repeat this process till all the errors are correct. If not, you are taking a risk. So even if someone sends you a file, don't trust it. Do this, then trust the file. It's very important. These are called green marks are called error checking. It checks nine different types of errors. So every time you open it, the message may be different, but you look at the message, look at the context and take correct action. Only when there are no green marks, you interpret and analyze the data. That's the rule. Okay. Now, when we have data, we want to analyze it. But what is data? Data means if the raw data is not in a good format, then analysis becomes difficult or lengthy or you spend too much time cleaning it up. So when we are designing the data or getting the data, you should know what is good, what is bad. So I'm not going to explain all of these, but just remember this. It's getting recorded, you can refer to it. 
there are articles about each one of them on my blog also but when you look at any piece of data which is raw data sent to you this is a checklist it says one okay two okay three okay if all ten okay that means the data is good i can start analyzing it if any of them are not okay you have to repair them that's called data cleaning all right this applies to raw data this is input not output output will come to later i don't have time for q and a but just imbibe this this is a checklist to apply for every piece of data all right now when data cleanup is required there are many methods available i will show you two for example here i have this data in one column but actually it should have been in three columns now those who know excel will know how to do it anyone can tell me quickly how do i split it into three columns text to column some of you know some of you don't know but those who know text to columns basically we are telling excel wherever there is a space make a column so now that could be comma tab whatever in this case space the problem is there is only one space here so we'll create three columns for this in this case there are two spaces extra we'll create four columns so it's not perfect so there is another very smart method of doing this just give an example of what you want and then go to data tab right next to text to column there is a magical button there which nobody has noticed for last 9 years it's called flash fill is 1 mm away from text to column still nobody noticed it <laughs> so notice it click on it excel will do the job how it does it not your problem <laughs> so again data tab text to columns flash fill the shortcut is control e it's a good thing to remember done it may not always work sometimes the pattern it is basically doing some kind of pattern matching if you are from it basically it is dynamically creating regular expressions with match the intended output if you didn't understand what is it forget it it will still work <laughs> so now i give an example it didn't work because what it is thinking is i want only the upper case characters so it made a mistake here so correct the mistake don't give up then it will think again and it's quite smart sometimes three or four examples are required if the data is not consistent if there is absolutely no pattern in the data nobody can help you but typically there is some pattern and this is very smart so use it it's called flash fill okay next now there can be many complex situations where you have to import and clean up data a very powerful new method has been added to excel which many excel users don't even know i am assuming you have the latest version of office and have many things i am showing will not be there in older version but we'll come to that later so how do you clean up data quickly without manual work you go to data tab and make sure there is area called get and transform this is extremely powerful and very quick method of importing data and cleaning it up there are 200 different ways in which we can clean up data without programming without any manual work i don't have time to explain but just trust me learn this get and transform if you don't have that get the latest version okay next i know i'm going fast but here i want to cover the entire spectrum of what you will come across individual topics if you go into too much detail then it is not going to work now one very important part of excel is once the data is clean you have to use excel tables so what is an excel table let me show you an example whatever happens in excel we have data first correct so this is my data very simple based on data we put what what do we put based on data we put formula so this formula is just doing a sum we also create charts this chart is based on the same data and i also have a pivot table which is counting how many entries are there so in a very large broad sense excel has data and based on the data we have charts formulas and pivot tables the problem is when i add more data nothing happens to any of those three it is your responsibility to remember where to go and manually update the formula and the range for chart and range for pivot table that's not your job 
If you use Excel like that, which I'm sure 100% of you do, that is called inefficiency. That means you are helping Excel. Excel was born to help us. So if you are doing something to Excel and again going to Excel itself and saying, I added data, that's inefficient. So how do you make it efficient? Once the data is clean, go to the raw data and select it. Go to insert menu and add a table. This is the single most powerful feature of Excel. Nothing happens, it puts some blue color. You can change that, but that's not important. Now notice what happens. When I add more data, I'm just going to zoom out so you can see the chart as well. The chart will update, the formula will update, pivot table range is also updated, but in pivot table, you have to say refresh. This will work across formulas, across sheets. So this saves you a humongous amount of time and guarantees accuracy. So this is a very, very important feature. First, look at the data. If it's bad, make it good. Once it is good, make a table, then use Excel. That's the workflow for using Excel. Uh, go to my blog, search for Excel tables, knowledge pack. There are 12 articles on Excel. Read all of them. Your life will improve. So this is what I just showed you. Now, when you have data, many times we have data which contains information about what? About locations. A lot of us have locational data. For example, I have some transactions here and each transaction is being shown as to which kind, where did it happen, date, which card was used, what was it used for, gender, amount, something like that. Now, when you want to analyze the data, what do you do? Of course, you will analyze in whatever way you want to, but there is locational information there. Whatever number of reports you create, you have never seen that locational information on a map. Seeing your own data on a map gives you additional useful information which you may have been missing lifelong. Nobody knows how to do it. So let me show you how easy it is to do it. You should have something containing location city, state, country, black long, all that works. So you go to insert menu, which I'm sure you have gone to. Yes, no? Yes. Have you seen all the buttons? No, because this button is looking at you since 2013, but nobody looked back. Same like flash fill. So just click on the button. It knows what to do. This requires internet access. I hope my internet works. Now what happens? It gives you a globe like this. It already understood that I have some locations, it is already plotted, but it's interpreting it as country. If it doesn't understand, you remove this and you add the field and whatever is the field name, in this case, whatever, actually that should have been name of the location. So whatever is the location column name, in this case by mistake it is a lover. I know it is a city, so this guy understands all of this out of the box. You don't have to pay anybody. This is a native feature of Excel. So I just ask him to interpret it as city. Now I will plot cities. I want to see revenue per city. So I go to some number which I have and plot it. So now I will draw a 3D bar chart for every location. You go to map labels, it will show you the location names. And you can work with it. You can zoom in, zoom out, you can tilt. You can rotate and do lots and lots of other things. Nobody knows this. Don't wait for your boss to ask this report. Bosses also don't know. <laughs> so whenever there is location information, use 3D map. Not for others, because the more you understand your data, more you manage whatever your field is. All right, next, I'm behind time. So another method of very often we create charts. So how do we create charts? I am sure you have created some reports in life. So someone gives you data, you create a chart. Now which type of chart to create, who decides? Customer decides, the regulator decides, boss decides. Very rarely will you be creating a fresh new report which nobody has already decided how it should look. So we are forced to give that report in that format, that chart, which is okay, you give that. But if you look at this, I'm sure you have gone to charts and made some charts. Try to visualize, read all the buttons there and tell me which is the biggest button.
needless to say nobody read it nobody clicked on it that is called an efficiency so irrespective of what chart your boss is asking just go and look at recommended charts it will use your data and create chart this is not random data this is your data i only created one column data that's why these charts were selected now i am selecting five columns of data i am clicking on the same button but you will notice that the charts have changed so it understands what data you have and chooses the best visualizations there is a scroll bar please scroll <laughs> i'm not saying you have to accept all of them but some of them will give you some new insight which will help you manage work better okay now sometimes charts are not very useful for example if i draw a line chart it is okay but it's all confusing overlapping all that at least they are in the same scale sometimes multiple scales doesn't work what i want to see is each of these products how has it fluctuated across time that is what i want to see how do i see that one is to draw a chart another is to again notice something which you have not noticed this is a line chart everyone knows 3d map we just saw next to that there is another line chart this is a special type of line chart so select empty area outside click on that line chart that's called spark line and then select the data the height should be same multiple columns now it draws the same information as independent charts without clutter that gives you better understanding of the pattern right now that all the numbers are between 0 and 100 but if these numbers were larger suppose one product sells much more than other products in a regular chart you can't see it properly here they are independent charts so you can see it better so use spark lines that is another very nice feature now when you want to summarize data because when we get data raw data as we call it raw data is transactional data what happens in that there are numbers 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 so if i this my transactions i can scroll 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 i'm not going to understand it in order to interpret understand analyze you have to summarize make large data into smaller piece many times we don't know how to do it so we manually do subtotals for example many people if i have to say total business for platinum total for silver like that what will most people do how many of you know pivot table look around i know the percentage 10% know pivot table other people will filter on each one at a time manually select the amount column नीचे जो टोटल दिखता है वो हाथ से लिखेंगे बाजू में बिकॉज वहाँ से कॉपी नहीं होता है फिर हाथ से डालेंगे उसमें भी मिस्टेक होता है दैट इज कॉल्ड इन एफिशेंसी सो प्लीज डोंट यूज सब टोटल दैट्स इन एफिशियंट देन वॉट शुड यू यूज शुड यूज पेवेट टेबल फॉर समराइजेशन एंड एनालिसिस सो लेट मी शो यू दिस अगेन वट एम आई डूइंग आई जस्ट क्रिएटेड अ टेबल एंड ऑफकोर्स रॉ डेटा मस्ट बी अ टेबल यू नो दैट करेक्ट सो आई हैव द डेटा I'm going to create a pivot table out of it. Let me show you how to do that. <coughs> so when you have the data, make sure it's clean. Make sure it's a table. Then go to insert and go to pivot table. When pivot table is on, this should be disabled because it should already be a table. now when you create pivot table it creates an empty report and gives you all the columns it says you play with it whatever you want i give you so let's say i want total amount so what do i do amount i drag and drop into value area i'll calculate the total no formulas i want to break it down by let's say type of expense each type should come in a row so drag and drop it in a row like that whatever you want let's say i want now by gender remove this put gender whatever it is it will do for you no calculations no manual work no subtotals now of course you can use multiple of this for example i want gender and month so i can put both of them so female and month male and month if i want month first i just drag and drop so take some raw data play with it and you will understand this is a very very useful feature now having done that it has many other nice things so let me show you two more 
Now, for example, here I have uh, some data here, and uh, let's see what I have. I have card type. Now I can see the breakup, but I want to see it as percentage. Most probably, you are going to add a formula outside. If you are trying to add a formula outside the pivot table, that means you don't know pivot table. Whatever you think you are doing, pivot table is capable of doing without you putting formula. So when you don't know something, you right click and look at all the options. The answer is there. Which one? Either summarize or show value as. Summarize is by default sum, which is what we want. So show values as. This gives you 13 brilliant options of looking at the same data in different ways. So in this case, I am just going to say percentage of column and it gives me that. No manual work is involved. Now if I remove this and put something else, you don't have to change a formula. It is still going to continue to do it. So that's the benefit. Now if I on top of it put anything else, say car, card type in columns, it will still do the same thing. Now, when it comes to monthly revenue, one of the other things we want to do is show month on month growth. So how do we do that? Here is another example of this. Right click, same thing, show values as and go to percentage difference from. Okay. Now if I say percentage difference from, it is asking you percentage difference from what? My cursor happens to be in Feb. That's why it is showing me Feb. That is not correct because Feb has to be compared with Jan. March has to be compared with Feb. I'm not comparing all months with Feb. If I want that, this is okay. So remember when there is a drop down, open the drop down. The drop down knows more than you know. So someone has thought that you will need next and previous. So this is how you calculate month on month growth or quarter on quarter growth or year on year growth. So everything in show values as is absolutely valuable. Two other things I'll show you about pivot table. When you put something in pivot table, these come from columns in the data. They are called fields. So month is a field, year is a field and so on. So I have a field called amount and I have a field called cashback. Now if I want net amount, this minus this, again you are going to put a formula outside, don't do that. This is a field, this is a field. So when you click on pivot table, go to analyze option in pivot table and then say fields item sets calculated field. So now here I just create a name for that field, don't touch that zero. Go and actually double click on whatever you want, that zero will go away and then double click on this and then you can put a more complex formula also it will do that as a part of the pivot table now if you remove the amount and cash back it doesn't bother it still continues to work so this is called calculated fees there's another aspect of it i'm just going to put month here and year in columns and sorry year in columns and let's put some amount now what I want to do for whatever reason is I want to do a ratio of what I did in 2014 divided by what I did in 2015, whatever reasons. Now this thing here is a field, okay? Understand field, field means column. The contents of the column are called items. So year is a field, 2013, 14, 15 are items. Month is a field, Jan, Feb, March are items. So what I am actually doing now is I am calculating across items. So click on any of the items, again go there. Now you will get this guy on. If you are not on an item, if you click somewhere else, that option will be disabled. So make sure you click on an item, go there, calculated item. Now give it a name, whatever you want to give. Now notice it's showing you fields and items. So same story, you can put whatever formula you want. In this case, I am just putting 2014 divided by 15. Why am I asking you to double click? Because there are some syntax rules. You have to put single inverted comma, which will never will occur to you and it will not work. So now the ratio is also calculated. I can remove 2014-15, the ratio will still be there. That is how you do more calculations in pivot table. Now, of course, Excel has 600 plus functions. Now, how many should you know? 
how many people who have been working on excel for 20 years no 20 or 30 50 something like that why do they not know the remaining 600 not because they don't need them they never bother to look at them that is called inefficiency so if you know limited set of functions you may be doing something in a very in in uh, inefficient manner in a roundabout way without realizing there was a direct way of doing it number one or there was a function which you desperately needed but you didn't know the function exists you're not doing that calculation which is like loss of business opportunity so for both places you need to know how to learn excel functions and that's surprisingly simple obviously i don't have time to show you all the functions but i'll teach you how to learn functions so whenever you have time do this go to formulas tab click on insert function don't go to most recently used don't go to all because that will be in random uh, alphabetical order go by category now if you are a finance person and you never need to touch let's say engineering functions then you can skip this unless it is absolutely not relevant in your field all others are relevant unless proved otherwise so let's take one of them now what do you do it shows you again an alphabetical list and whatever is highlighted it shows you a one line description of what that function does read that line you have to read those 650 lines you have that much time you do not click ok even if you like the function say oh this log looks interesting let me learn it please do not click ok because you will get tangential get diverted only in that function you will never come back here just note down the interesting functions first and then whenever you get time that's your job to manage the backlog now how do you learn a function so let's say npv is a function whatever it does it finds the net present value it gives you a dialog which allows you to understand what parameters it gives you help about each parameter and so on and so forth then you can learn the function if you click here this does another nice thing it goes to the browser and it will give you detailed help on that function not only that it will do something else what will it do at the bottom at the absolute bottom there are examples so what are you supposed to do you look at those examples and use them because by reading examples on screen you are not going to understand that formula you have to play with it so what do you do suppose this was the example so you go to the first so called cell of that example copy it in from here the whole table so to say copy it then come back to empty excel sheet and then make sure you are in A1 and paste it. It will look bad. This small little irritating uncle comes, click on it and use the second thing. That will make it okay. Now this function will work. So now what it is showing is actual live function. You can play with it. So you don't have to waste time creating data. It's already there. That is how you learn each function. Even if you know the functions, read the syntax, there may be other arguments which you have not understood. So you, just because you have been using a function doesn't mean you know it fully. That is the way to learn all relevant Excel functions. Okay, now the specific functions I want you to learn irrespective of what is your field is present value, future value and PMT. This is very important for managing personal finance. Everyone needs to do that. And for these functions, Microsoft has also created a special calculator. So if you just, what is... Uh, this function called PMT used for PMT is used for calculating EMI. So just type PMT. Notice this is a tool tooltip. In that tooltip there is a hyperlink. If you click on the hyperlink of the function name, it will go to browser. Now this of course shows you syntax and examples. It gives you another special feature called Excel Formula Coach. Click on that. It actually gives you a wizard. It tells you how to use it. How to calculate AMI in this case. This is a live example and then you can learn from it. You don't even have to copy paste in Excel. They are one step further. So for some common formulas this is also available. So irrespective of who you are learn these functions. Okay now goal seek. Goal seek is a very nice useful thing. Again in the example which I gave what is the benefit? Suppose I am taking a loan and I am using the same formula which I just showed you what is this i want to borrow let's say 30000 rupees at the interest rate of 12% for 5 years this is the emi i have to pay 
this is the function now suppose you realize that i can pay 1000 rupees per month means my borrowing capacity is higher what should be my so my paying capacity is higher i can pay 1000 how much more can i borrow that's a what if kind of situation i cannot put the number 1000 here because the formula will get erased so what do i want to tell this guy make this 1000 by changing this that is called goal c this is a single formula it can be a chain of complex formulas also it works equally well one of the input parameters you can manipulate so what do you do go to data tab what if analysis goal c so it will give you this small little dialog saying what do you want to do this is the cell you are interested in okay what do you want to do with it i want to set it to let's say 1200 and by doing what by changing this cell which is the borrowed amount now excel will do the math and give you the number this is extremely useful this is there for 26 years <laughs> so try this out now whenever you are learning different subjects another thing you have to parallelly do why am i showing you so many diverse things because you are going to learn so many subjects, so many concepts, then you have to map, oh that thing will help you. And then even if it is not taught to you, you try it out. That is how you become good at whatever you are doing. So that is about goal C. Now Microsoft introduced a brilliant new feature. Many times you do research. Uh, Microsoft created a brilliant new data type. Normally what are data types? Number, date, text, like that. Microsoft created two special new data types. I'll show you how to use them if internet works, otherwise I have another demo. So I've just written three stocks. I don't know their stock code. So I select them, I go to data tab and notice there are two special data types called stocks. So I click on stocks. Now it understood HDFC and Yes Bank, didn't understand Tata Steel. It's asking me Tata Steel from NAC, BSC, where? So I say okay, BSC. So now I did say so select so it will understand now it has understood now what is the benefit of this you will see a small little icon here when you click here it will give you everything about that stock and it's not only india it understands worldwide stock exchanges this is not just the current price it will give you all these parameters so let's say market cap understand the similarly, there is another called geographical information. Same thing, you select instead of stocks, you click on geography. Again, it will understand it. Let's put Mumbai also. This is also it understood. Now, when I click on it, notice all kinds of demographic information is available out of the box. No going to Wikipedia, no copy paste. It's live and you can put further formulas on top of this. Now Mumbai's data is not available, so it will give you an error. So let's say population. Okay, so start using these. That's called geography and stocks. Okay, conditional formatting is another way of learning from the data. So when you have data, this is one way of looking at it. But suppose I want to just compare Notice if you read that data one by one, you'll realize that this is very low revenue, this is very low revenue. It's not obvious. Even if you see a chart, it is not obvious. So what is conditional formatting? You select the data and instead of adding a chart outside, you go to home tab, conditional formatting. You can ask this guy to put a data bar here itself. Now, you don't need to read the data. The data is telling you how to interpret it. There are five different ways of conditional formatting. This is one of them. Now, without reading the numbers, you know, either Kujgat Bada. Another way of doing that is to classify high, medium, low. That's called same conditional formatting, icon 6, three categories, 4 or 5. I am using 3. So now the same data is giving you different kind of classification. It takes the minimum, maximum, divides the range into 33%, 67 and 100. You can change that if you like. So that is another very nice feature. You can use it with web pivot table as well. Now, very often we need to forecast in business. So for forecasting, again, Microsoft added a brilliant new feature. 
those of you who understand statistics you require linear regression you need exponential smoothing you need to create first you understand is this is the seasonality or not you need to understand the equation slope intercept r square too much so what do you do minimum for forecasting you need one column containing time and the time slot should be uniform that means if it is month all should be months if it's year all should be years and whatever is the data now I have this actual data for whatever number of months based on that i want to forecast next few months what will be my the kind of wrong way of doing it is to take average and put some gut feel based growth factor that is the worst way of doing forecasting the correct way of doing forecasting requires statistical knowledge so now you don't need that what do you do you just click inside the data of course it should be a table next to what if analysis you will see forecast sheet so it will ask you it has already created the forecast it's asking you where how many future periods do you want there are some options very often forecast has seasonality for example during diwali there is more sale that's called seasonality normally we have to specify seasonality this guy can even detect seasonality automatically and it gives you a lot of other statistics you say okay Let's change some parameters now what it did is this is your data this is the data you have and this is the forecast there's the pessimistic optimistic a different lower confidence bond upper confidence bond and this is the chart the orange area is this is the middle this is upper lower bound this is all on flat and of course if you want to learn this is nothing rocket science these are the functions it uses which are of course very well documented this is how you do forecasting with or without seasonality now in such a short time i have shown you many different methods of analysis even if you have not tried them you know there are many methods of analysis now the next question is when you have data in hand which method are you going to use you in last 10 minutes you know 10 methods so the question is when you have your own data which method will you use and if you think a little the first answer which comes to mind is it depends on the data or depends on the situation so now remember very important thing i don't have a slide for it but i'm sure you will remember when it comes to office the first thing which comes to your mind is always wrong it may apply to other parts of life also but i'm not going there first thought which comes even if it works it's inefficient wrong means not optimal so why am i saying that the idea of analysis is to learn all possible useful things from the data that is called analysis most people 99.9% .9 people get data produce some reports how many reports they create that means how many things they learn from the data depends on how many reports are being demanded by boss customer colleague regulator whoever so if you create seven reports for example in the data the data never told you there are only seven useful things there could be equally useful 8 9 10 23rd 75th we are not looking at that because nobody is asking so if nobody is asking and you look at it that's your growth so that is your differentiator so if you find something useful and boss doesn't know you'll get credit for it that is how you drive growth so the answer is when you have many methods of analysis known to you you should apply every method to every piece of data because each one is giving you additional information if different methods were giving you the same information they wouldn't be different methods correct right? the problem is if i say that it's easy to say but in real life what will you have to do notice what i did i did this separately correct right? then i applied conditional formatting i did that separately then i undo another conditional formatting i did so many things i have to apply interpret remove that use the other one that's painful so microsoft created something brilliant for this which of course nobody knows this it is there for 11 years now it's called quick analysis how do you do that it's so simple you will laugh at yourself for not using it so this is my data notice what is going to happen now i am not going to apply any method of analysis manually i'm just going to select the data what happened nothing happened it is waiting for me to do something right no something happened this uncle came so whenever this thing comes nobody clicks on it everyone hates it everyone in the world wants to know how to never see this again <laughs>
Microsoft knows this is a very irritating feature. One billion people use Excel. For 18 years, Microsoft has kept this feature because they know it is good for humanity, even if humanity gets irritated. <laughs> so whenever you find an irritating feature in office, assume it is good for you, go there and learn it. So notice how brilliantly this is done. That icon came on its own. When you click on it, what is it showing you? Showing you all the options we just saw. You don't have to click. You just hover the mouse cursor. This is one way. You don't never saw recommended charts, no problem. Recommended charts are coming here. It's giving you sum, average, count, total, running total. Horizontally and vertically. It is giving you pivot tables also out of it if it makes sense. And it is giving you spark lines which we had earlier drawn manually. Now there is no excuse for looking at the data from every angle. So this is one part of full analysis. Other part is look at all the options in show value as and try them. You will understand better, you will manage better. All right, let's go further. 34, 51. Okay, so very often we use Excel for printing things. And because Excel is unlimited space horizontally and vertically, at the last moment it goes out of the page. One column will come somewhere, one cell will go on fourth page. It is very irritating. So if you know that you are going to work on an Excel file and you intend to print it, what should you do? When you know this file I want to print, from beginning itself, while you are working on Excel, go to View tab and go to Page Layout View. This is not Print Preview. This is like Word. It is actually showing you live pages. This is the default view in Word. So we never have printing problem in Word. This is not the default view in Excel. So make it default for print worthy files. So now I can see how it's going to print. And in Print Preview, you can only change column widths. Here, this is full version of Excel. I can do everything here. So you'll never have last moment problems with printing. Okay, one completely unrelated but important topic. The importance of searching in Google. All of us do that. Now on my YouTube channel, there is a 40 minute video on how to search in Google. See that later. But let me tell you two things. So what happens in Google when you search for something? Now notice my name is Nitin Paranjpe. So I search for it. Okay. What happened? This is me. That was my older version. <laughs> this is a different Nitin Paranjpe. He was CEO of Hindustan Lever. Now he has gone to US again in Unilever. But now when I am searching for my name, I don't want another Nitin Paranjpe to come. So now how do I tell that to? Now another thing, if I search Nitin Paranjpe without inverted, it will search for Nitin anywhere on the page and Paranjpe anywhere on the page. That is the worst way of searching. Never have multiple words without quotations, unless you want it that way. But this is also not helping me. So minus sign Unilever, that is the syntax. Now it's only me. Now of course there is another Nitin Paranjpe down who has another company, so I can say minus that also. So there are many brilliant things which we just don't know about. Outlook is simpler to use, but there are some very specific ways to use it. I'm not going to show you too many demos, but get the concept clear. By the way, Outlook works with all email IDs. Whatever type of email you have, Outlook will work with that. In a single profile, you can have multiple profiles or multiple emails managed. Email, best email client is Outlook. Now, many times we don't use calendar. Now, remember, you have life. Life has limited time and you have a lot of things to do. So, if you really want to make sense of your life, you have to start using calendar properly. You are learning and this is the best time to start valuing time and using it effectively. So now what do you do in calendar? Appointments you put in calendar, I am sure you know that, but we don't do that. Only formal appointments need not go there. Anything which is going to consume your precious life should go there. Now. That is how you use a calendar. But let's come to something else. When you go to Outlook and you are using Microsoft email, you will see in inbox two things, focused and other. Many people just don't notice that other part. How does that other come? When 
we have an inbox, a lot of mails come, a lot of time goes in handling them. Microsoft wanted to reduce the amount of manual effort you put in scanning mails and deciding which one is important to you. So what happens in Outlook if you have an exchange server behind? It analyzes the way you use email. So in a couple of weeks, the artificial intelligence algorithm will understand which mails you respond to, which mails you are not really interested in. They are not spam, they are not junk, they are official mails, but you don't jump at them. So those kind of mails will automatically put in other. You don't have to do anything. The only thing you have to notice that there is something in other and because it's a machine learning algorithm, there can be false positives. So some mail which the algorithm thought is not important has landed there. You have not noticed it because you never went there. So if that happens, you have to monitor it on alternate days. If something went there by mistake, right now I don't have anything. But assuming there was something which was important to me and I see it there, I don't want this guy to make a mistake again. So right click on it and say always move to focused. It's machine learning. The machine is learning. This is the way to teach that machine. Next time onwards it will manage. So that is the only thing you need to know about focused inbox. Now the most important folder in Outlook is not inbox, it is not calendar. The most important folder is tasks because whatever you get salary is for doing work, correct? If you do the work properly, you will grow. If you have a JD, you don't deliver what is in the JD, you are not going to grow. If you exceed the JD, you will grow. Now whatever is in JD is not a task. It needs to be broken down into tasks. Tasks may be personal, professional, doesn't matter, but time is time. So task folder is the best place for keeping a master list of all your work in life. You can color code it like this. These are called categories. Now many people make the mistake of putting tasks in calendar. That is wrong. Calendar is an appointment. Task is task. Appointment means something happens at that time, that place. When I put a task and say due date is 15, right? I am not going to do that task on the last day. I have not decided when I will do it. So there is a difference between calendar, calendar date and a deadline. Deadline means that is the upper limit. I will decide when to do it before. Okay, so this is step number one, tasks. Nobody uses tasks or even if you use tasks, your task list is scattered all over the place. If something is in notepad, something in minutes of meeting, lot of it in mind, something in Excel. And when you want to really decide what should I do now or how do I plan my week, you can't sort across 20 different places. Master list means you can sort, filter, prioritize, manage. So you should go to this task folder as frequently as you go to inbox. In fact, first folder you go to should be task, not inbox or calendar. Because task is 100% your work. Inbox is mixed. You send a mail, your work. You reply to a mail, others work. Right? Task is 100% yours. But this is just step one. Making a list is step one. Now to do this, you need to find time. Now if you just say whenever I get time, I'll do it, it will not happen. So at least for important tasks, this is what you have to do. You open two windows. In one window, you open calendar. In the other window, so you go to calendar, make it full screen. In the other window, you right click on task and say open in new window. Make this window small. Both windows are now visible. So now you can decide, okay, this is my week looking like. This is an important thing. When should I do it? So what did I do just now? I took an appointment with myself to do my own work. That is called time management. So step one, master list of tasks, at least for important tasks to have ahead of time. Now you will be able to manage things much more proactively. There is no hard and fast rule that this has to be used only for corporate work or study. It can be used beautifully for personal things as well. So step one, make a task list. Step two, find time to execute it. This is very simple, I am not going to demonstrate it. 99.9% .9 emails you get are black. There are 16 million colors. Please use them. As it is, people don't read your mail. At least the color is different, they will read it. <laughs> don't use grotesque colors. Don't be offensive. Use subdued colors. Don't use red. Use blue, purple, something. Correct? Just to make it more interesting and attractive. Now, very often, we send a mail to someone and say, I want information about this and this and this. We ask five different questions. 
now the questions may be verbose now when they reply they say reply then go to each question then press enter enter then they type then again next question they have to find again press enter enter and type three times it happens you have no clue who has answered what how and the formatting also let's jump it up so whenever you are asking for information from people user <coughs> sorry <coughs> Use a very simple thing. That's called table. All of you know table in Word, correct? Right? All of you know table in Word. So create a table like this. So if I am asking for information from customer, and I have four questions, right? First column question, second question. Now suppose you have to reply to those. I have camera. Now suppose customer replied here. Then you want to reply to that. Add another column. Add another column. It's brilliant. This itself shows a level of professionalism. It's very simple, but nobody uses it. So that's what I mean. If you want input, create a table. Now, OneNote is a brilliant product. I don't know how many use it. How many is OneNote? Very good. That's a good number. So what is OneNote? OneNote is a place for taking all kinds of notes. Start using OneNote if you don't already have it. Make sure you have it on mobile as well. And the OneNote notebook, basically OneNote is an electronic notebook. So what is the notebook? You create a notebook. So I have, this is a demo notebook. I have multiple notebooks. Now for the most important thing, when you create a notebook file new, don't create it on PC. Same story. Create it on personal OneDrive in your case. If you have corporate OneDrive, use that also. What is the benefit? Once you have that, it will be synchronized with your mobile as well. What is the benefit? You can create as many notebooks as you want. In your case, each subject should be a notebook. And these are topics. Each topic should be section and any number of pages. There is no limit to how many notebooks you can create, number of sections, number of pages. So because life becomes very organized. Now having said that, OneNote has many brilliant features. Some of them I will cover. So one of the things we do is meetings. Even in college, you're going to do a lot of meetings. Now I have a meeting here. I'm going to take notes about this meeting. Six months later, what are the chances that I will find those notes quickly? Whether it's paper, notepad, mobile, I don't care, or Word, Excel. Notes are there somewhere, but you can't find them. So taking notes without having a linkage between the meeting and notes is useless. So how do you take notes? Notes are taken in one note. This is how what do you do? When you don't know something, what do you do? You right click and read all the options. Go to meeting notes. Now notice what does this meeting have? Some invitees, some document, some agenda, whatever. Now just say take my own notes. Now it will show you all your notebooks. Choose a notebook, choose a topic and say OK. Now what happens? Unlike Word or a notepad, it doesn't give you a blank page. It actually gives you something else. Let me just refresh it once more. So what does it do? It created a page, added all the details. You can also keep track of who attended, who did not attend. And then you can take notes. Now whatever notes are being taken are auto-saved. There is no file name asked, no folder name asked. And when you finish the meeting, what do you do? You just close it. That's it. Now what happens six months later? You may not know the notebook name, page, nothing. Go to the calendar. Go to the same place. Again, say take one notes. This time it won't ask you. It knows where it is. It will find the page and give you. That is how you link notes to meetings. Now if you have taken notes on paper, you didn't have a laptop that time, what do you do? When you have the laptop, go to the laptop, create a page, link to the thing, take a photo, put it there from paper, it's still linked. Okay, so that is how OneNote is brilliant for linking meeting to notes. Now during taking notes, what happens? We, this is a task. Now task should go to task folder. Lot of action items come during meetings. 
we'll forget to put it in task folder and get delayed. Now in the meeting, I don't have time to go through copy paste, go to task. So again, right click, there's an option here, make a task in Outlook tomorrow. These guys know how to talk to each other. The task has gone to Outlook. Now you can manage it like a regular task. So that is the integration between reverse way, one note to Outlook. Having said that, when the task is marked as complete, which we will do in Outlook mostly, these guys again know how to talk the other way, they will be marked as complete there as well. Don't get discouraged if it doesn't get, it takes 20 seconds to update, it will happen, don't worry. Now one of the other brilliant things it allows you to do is browser based copy paste. So if I go to a browser page and let's say I am just copying this, I just like this. I copy something from a browser page. Typically where will you paste it? In Word. Of course it will get pasted. But six months later you are going to forget the URL. This happens when you are doing research. So what am I doing? I copied from web page. Instead of Word, I am pasting it in, in one note. What happened? It automatically pastes the link. As simple as that. Okay, so another thing, very often if it's too much of discussion going on, you can't capture everything. If you can't capture everything, something you'll forget, something may get disputed, some ambiguity will come later. So what do you do? If you can't capture everything, and you should not because you can't participate in the meeting, when you're sitting in a meeting, go to insert menu and say record audio. All laptops have a mic, make sure your mic works. It records, it doesn't ask you any question, recording the only thing you have to remember is when the meeting is finished remember to stop recording that will record your entire life <laughs> now having done that this sounds very simple and useful but in reality it is not i'll tell you why so this is a meeting i have already recorded 19 minutes of audio maybe some meeting goes on for three hours i'll have three hours of audio now what is the practical problem you are going to face tell me Later on, when you want to read those notes, you, do you really want to hear the whole recording? No, you have gone there to clarify something, there is some dispute, something like that. So maybe in this case, there is a dispute about this Teams pilot. There is a play button, I can play, but then it is going to play from beginning to end. That's boring. I don't want to play the whole thing. I want to see or hear rather what was being spoken when that word or I wrote. So that play, this play button is not very useful. This play button is useful. If you attended a lecture, you took notes and you have a shared OneNote notebook and your other person in the group who has bunked the lecture wants to hear the whole lecture, it will automatically scroll through the notes as the lecture progresses. That is the purpose of this play button. But if I want clarification about this, that play button is useless. Now during the meeting, I don't know what will get disputed, so Microsoft doesn't bother. It gives you a play button for everything you have written. So I click here, it will start from exactly. So let's say we have an action point now. So let's say there is no pilot for me. So that is called one node. So now if I click here, it will be different. So it has taken care of another aspect. So start using it. One node also has a nice calculator. For example, we have some 400 people I was told in this room. So let's say 413 people. Let's say you are going to save at least 7 minutes every day and there are 187 working days in a year. How much everyone will save? There is a calculator. use it. Now, when you have a scanned document, you can't search in the document. So if you have a scanned document and you want to search in it, the only method available is scroll, scroll, scroll and read, which is pathetic. So what do you do? You go to file menu, it need not be PDF, it can be anything. Go to print. I am sure you have seen this printer in the past, but you never noticed it because our general idea is, I notice only things I know and I ignore things I don't know. That is called inefficiency. Every feature has a purpose. 
finding the purpose is called efficiency. So print to one node, then what happens? The same thing will get printed to one node. So what is the big deal? The same scan document came here, two pages. The big deal is this, one node can search in an image. So control F is find. I am just typing the character A, notice what it did. This is available for 20 years. <laughs> and of course, this can also be used for other things. Many times you have to file expense claims, you have receipts and you have to do data entry again. What happens now? This is just a single image. So what do I do? It goes one step further. What happened here? I could search. If you want the text, you can say copy text from the image, all pages if you like. And then you can go to Word and what do you do? You create a new Word document, just paste it. It gives you the text. That's not all. If it is an image, of course, it will give you that text. So this is a receipt and I want to put it in the expense claim management system. I say copy text from picture and then once the text is there, I can put it anywhere. So that is the brilliance of one note. It also, if you have a stylus, it's brilliant for handwriting because note taking also becomes very easy. Handwriting is very easy to do with this. So I have written this using a stylus. I have a stylus. I can take notes using the stylus. So having done that, what happens? Now I have already taken notes. Now this is not text, this is ink. Now if I search for something, will it find it? That is the question. So it does understand handwriting as well. So let's say I'll search for Y. Not only that, if you don't want to keep it this way, notice what I have written, one note is very nice, it gives you freedom, whatever, whatever. I say, okay, now I am done, convert it to text. So it does that as well. I think office deserves some round of applause. No? Okay, enough, enough. PowerPoint. This is the most important thing in PowerPoint. The purpose of PowerPoint is to put forward your point with power. By putting bullets, we make it powerless. Generally, when you are presenting to someone, there is an objective. You are teaching, selling, convincing. To achieve that objective, people have to remain awake mentally. Some people flatly fall asleep in front of you, but some people keep their eyes open, but they are mentally asleep. So you have to keep them mentally also awake and manipulate their minds to get what you want. That is the purpose of PowerPoint. And the worst way to do that is to use bullets. Never use bullets. So what do you do? You remember I showed you there was a 3D thing so rotating earlier, right? You can create such things yourself. You don't need to have a 3D design software. In Windows, there is something called 3D paint. Earlier we had a good old paintbrush, right? That paintbrush has now been replaced with Windows. The software is called 3D Paint. All Windows can have it. So if I go to 3D Paint, it looks like this. This is the cube I created. How do you create your own? You go to File, File New, and I'll just show you how it is done. Just creating a 3D shape. I'll create a cube. Now this is a 3D object. You can rotate it in space. You can rotate it like this, like this. You can put stickers on it. You can merge objects. It's simplistic 3D, not sophisticated 3D modeling. But the idea is when you do that, you say file, save as. And of course, you should save the original 3D model for further editing. But when you say save as image, it will give you various options and different type of 3D options are available. So if you save it not as an image, but if you save it as a 3D object, there is something different happens. This file called GLB is understood by PowerPoint. So if you go to PowerPoint, in insert, there are 3D models. 
now 3D models from file. And that GLB file you can import. Now once it is imported, you can play with it. You can rotate it, you can animate it and so on and so forth. So now notice this is a 3D object. What am I doing? I am rotating it like a 3D object. And there is an animation here, special animations with called this turntable, which is what I have used earlier. That is how this guy was rotating like this. It is that easy. Bottom line, even if your presentation is pathetic, at least people will ask you, Ye kaisa <laughs> Now you don't have to create 3D objects. There are many beautiful 3D objects available out of the box. So you go to insert 3D models and go to online sources. Microsoft has a quite a big library of 3D models which you can choose from. Some of them are even animated like this. This is an animated 3D model. So when I show this, I don't have to animate it, this guy is hovering on its own. But it is a full-fledged 3D model. In the sense, I can click on it, I can rotate it, whatever I did earlier, I can do with this guy. So I go to 3D model. There are multiple scenes also available sometimes, depends on the 3D model. So this is one of the scenes. Notice I am doing all kinds of things. Now. It also has another thing. This is scene number one. There is another scene available here. There is a third scene available. And so on and so forth. You get the idea. Now, very important, even if simplest of slide, the biggest problem we have is when the slide becomes crowded, things go one behind another. We spend time, you send to back, bring to front, then you don't know who is in front, who is in back, and then you waste time. That is called inefficiency because you are helping PowerPoint. PowerPoint is not helping you. For example, here, here I have some simple thing. I have one box, step one, then I have another box on top of it, step two, and another box on top of it. All working fine. Now, unfortunately, step one, step two, step three all have the same color. I want to change it. Now, how do I change the color of step one? I already nicely arranged them center. So, either I struggle with send to back, bring to front, and confuse myself and PowerPoint, or I disturb that beautiful alignment and do like this. Both of which are bad. So, your best friend for PowerPoint is this guy should always be on. What is the problem here? Selection is the problem. Changing format is not the problem. So, for every problem, there is a solution. All the editing commands are in home tab, you know that. The problem is, we have never seen all the buttons. So, which button do we need now? I want an easy way to manipulate objects by quickly identifying what I am doing and selecting it. Obviously, select. But nobody selected the button called select, that's the paradox. So, whatever pain you have had now is gone, it's called selection page. Now it shows you a list of objects. What is at the bottom is at the back. What is on top is in front. So even without touching these objects, I can actually say this. I have selected without seeing it. And just to show you that it works without seeing it also, I am changing it. Then I am clicking on the second one. Again it is selected. I am changing it to something else and done. So selection pane is your best friend for slide making. Okay, now cropping. I'm sure all of you know cropping, but there is more to it, of course. What is more to it? Very easy. Suppose I have this and I want to only keep the face of the cow. What will you do? Of course, everyone knows cropping. You will go to picture tools and say crop. Very good. And then what will you do? Either say thoda karega, either say thoda karega. Is it worth humanity? No. So the correct thing is, yes, go to crop, 
decide how much area you want to give first and then drag this guy. <laughs> Okay, another thing. I have a cake. I want to crop the cake. Now, whatever you do, it is rectangular. Cake is circular. What do you do? Whatever you struggle with crop, it is not going to work. So, you don't struggle. Another best practice is look. Have you looked at the crop button before? Yes, but look again. Now, look at what happens. This is a double button. Please understand, humanity has not understood double buttons. <laughs> this is different. This is different. The biggest example you have never understood is new slide. <laughs> this is choosing the layout of front. That is the best way to create correct kind of slides. Now mind coming to picture format. There is a drop down. Drop down is not for decoration, it is designed for human beings to manually drop it down. Why did Microsoft create a drop down? Because monitors have finite size and Microsoft has many benefits to offer, they don't fit. So when you drop it down, lot of things come. Now Microsoft has so many shapes, which shape? So it doesn't matter, all the shapes in PowerPoint are available here. You will feel really sad about, miserable about your past life. <laughs> now of course this is a rectangle, so this is not a circle, it's an ellipse. So now you have to go to crop again. And now notice these are crop marks. So now what will you do? You will crop it from here and here, that is twice, that is inefficient. Press control key and drag once, then it will crop together. Okay, so now, now you know how to crop. Next. Okay, another very brilliant feature is remove background without Photoshop. So recently there was a place where some cow went under an airport. I want to show that. Surat, I think. Now I have a cow, I have an airport, but these don't match. <laughs> so what do I do? I need to only keep the cow. No amount of shape, there is no cow shape available in pop. <laughs> so crop to cow is not going to work. So when you don't know something, look at the menu on top. Why not right click? Because if it's a bigger problem, look at the top. It's a local problem, you right click. Now look at all the buttons, which you have never seen. The first button happens to be remove by now. In case you didn't notice. Now, how does it know what do you want to keep? So it's quite intelligent, but it's not perfect. So obviously the legs got cut off and stuff like that. So you can help PowerPoint's algorithm by saying, I'll tell you what to keep. So you say mark area to keep. Now, of course, with a shaky mouse or touchpad, you can't be doing perfect things. You don't have to. Just a little bit of touch up and it will do it. If it does excessively, so don't delete, undo. <laughs> So again, mark areas to keep, sorry, mark areas to remove, I have chose the wrong one. Mark areas to keep, in this case, choose the leg, just approximately draw, it is quite smart. It has almost done it, you don't have to be perfect, if it makes a mistake, undo. Now what happens, this came, now mark areas to remove, again, understands quite well. And now, we can actually show the cow. <laughs> now all of you think that your job is going to go because of your AI or artificial intelligence or machine learning? No. This is how it is going to enhance our lives. I will give you an example. I am making a slide. I have these photos. I want to arrange them. I have put, this was I think last to last batch of Wellington. These are different sessions I have done in different places. Never mind. Now all pictures are different size, different shape, different aspect ratio. Whatever may be my salary, even CEOs spend 20 minutes arranging those slides and whatever you do, they are still going to look shabby. Because that's not your job. So what do you do now? You go to design because there is a design problem. 
uh, even if you are a designer, once you see this, you will not try to apply your design knowledge here. So what do you want to design? Look at all the buttons. These are templates, you know, different colors. No, this variant nobody looks at. This is called artificial intelligence applied in real life. I hope my internet is still working. So it will analyze the photos, it will analyze your slide thing and it will give you multiple different ways of doing it. So I'll just copy paste this slide on a new slide and then try again. So I'm just going to take a layout which contains title and this and I'm going to paste this randomly. Now I go to design, design ideas and let's see if it understands. Notice not one, it gives you options and the colors will be chosen based on the theme or the color combination of your design. Now this is not all, there is another brilliant thing. Suppose I am writing something, I have to save time, I am going to copy paste, but just give me a second to show this. I have a history of something and to save time I will just copy paste. So I want to show the progression of my company or a product which I created, the timeline. So this is what I did, this is what I have. If I show like this, people are going to fall asleep. So what do I do? I go to design and go to design ideas. It created a timeline out of it. Not only that, it's so intelligent, it gave you different options. Of course, different kind of timeline, but even that is not all. A more beautiful looking timeline, even that is not all. This is more like a MS Project Gantt chart type. There is more details, but the best one is this. It actually find icons for all of them automatically. That is good. <laughs> Machine learning in action. This is called PowerPoint is helping you. You are not helping PowerPoint. Okay, now many times we have presentations which are large and it becomes difficult. For example, I have this sample presentation. These are introduction slides. These are Excel slides, these are Word slides, these are PowerPoint slides. Now notice what I have done. I have actually segregated them. How do you do that? You go to a logical point between the slides, right click and say add section. When you say add section, a section gets added. You can rename it and give it a name. That's all there is to it. You can do it, retrofit into existing presentation as well. Now what is the benefit of this? Let's say I am showing something, I am showing Excel to people and they say I don't want Excel, go to PowerPoint. Most people in the world will press escape or irritate everyone till they reach PowerPoint tomorrow. So now what do I do? I don't press escape, I don't come out of the presentation. What do I do? I right click and then say what? See all slides. The shortcut for that is minus key. Now I can see my topics here, I can go to PowerPoint without disturbing the presentation. So it gives you interactivity during the presentation. Not only that, if it is a very large presentation, you can say collapse all. And tomorrow I am going to show PowerPoint first. So in bulk, I can rearrange my thoughts and my presentation. If someone wants only word slides, I click, copy paste all slides will go. Now as though this don't clap, but uh, <laughs> because there is more. As though this is not enough, if this is so nice, wouldn't you ideally want to show a menu to the customer, right? Showing this is what I have, you tell me what do you want. Now suppose I create a menu, what will I do? I will create a slide, I will manually copy paste a thumbnail, then I will put a hyperlink, so I will put a slide containing word, Excel, PowerPoint, something like that. Right now I am doing it as text. Now what will I do? I will say hyperlink and then in hyperlink what will I do? I will say place in this document, what was that, excel right, so I will find my excel slide, correct, very good, and then I will say ok, I assume I have done it, so I show a menu like this, four options, excel will work, excel has some slides, when excel slides finish what is going to happen, it is not going to come back to the menu, it will spill over to the other topic, now we know that, so we are very intelligent, what do we do? 
अपने पास बहुत टाइम है लास्ट स्लाइड फाइंड करके उसमें और एक हाइपर लिंक डालेगा मेनो स्लाइड को फिर बाद में कोई और एक स्लाइड डालेगा उसमें भूल जाएगा इट्स अ टोटल क्योटिक थिंग रिमेंबर फर्स्ट थॉट इज रॉन्ग सो वॉट यू डू वी हैव ऑलरेडी क्रिएटेड नाइस सेक्शंस करेक्ट नाउ यू विल जस्ट लीव इट टू पॉर पॉइंट यू गो टू इंसर्ट मेनो दिस इज अ कम्प्लीटली आउटस्टैंडिंग आइडिया यू से क्रिएट अ समरी जूम so it says okay these are the slides what do you want so it has already selected the slides where the section started i don't want the first section so i removed that slide so i say insert so notice what it did it created a separate section called summary so now onwards i show my presentation like this i show the introduction okay done and the thumbnail of my slide came here when i go here it's going to zoom in nicely go there and beautifully come back now wait don't clap <laughs> now notice what i'm doing i'm making this powerpoint bigger okay i am making this also bigger just never mind the slide is distorted what happened here even the thumbnail is live that is called the software helping you so start using this this is called sections and once you have sections in it insert zoom okay very good now again sometimes that design ideas will not help you want to depict something so use smart art how many of you use smart art that's a good number okay <laughs> so what is smart art you type text no problem and what do you do you right click and say choose depending on what you are trying to depict you choose the correct diagram so now this is swot analysis do you know what is swot analysis strength weakness opportunity threat so which diagram will be useful you have to think so quickly tell me row number column number whatever your answer is remember first thought is wrong so the answer is none of these diagrams the answer is more <laughs> because of lack of space powerpoint cannot show you all the 145 diagrams it has so it is in your interest to learn all those diagrams so now here i am going choosing the correct category and because it's a matrix i am choosing a matrix this one looks good so like that i will convert this to this now don't waste time selecting a box and putting color that is also thought of it gives you colors your color sense may be pathetic it may look beautiful to you but other <laughs> but other spook i am sure you have seen yellow background with white foreground now a very important shortcut I was not planning to show it, but I'll show you anyway. Sometimes we want to show opportunity and threats first, and then now it's a problem. So because I've already written all this, so whenever rearranging of anything comes into picture, there is a brilliant shortcut available. For example, I want to show opportunities and threats. The ideal, ideally, what will you do? Cut paste or drag down. Don't do either of them. Select it and press Shift Windows Alt. up arrow or down arrow that is the way way to rearrange for example here notice regulatory changes second this is first i am pressing shift windows or up down this works wherever there is a paragraph context so it will work in word work in one note it will work in powerpoint it will not work in excel so that is one example now here is how you decide which diagram to choose i have comparing two products So now I of course right click, go to Smart Art, More Smart Art. Normally when you see the button More, nobody clicks on it because our brain immediately tells us जाने का नहीं more trouble. <laughs> more means more benefits. Now the problem is this is too much. So first look at the category. I am comparing things. Which category? Relationship. Now look at the diagrams quickly and tell me which row, which column. I am comparing. I'm showing this one is better or that one is better. There is nothing to think of. First, first in this case, so it shows like this. 
Now suppose the competitor also added a new feature, notice what happens. They got balanced. That is why it is called smart art. Okay, now next, counterbalance. Pricing is decided by demand or supply. I said the demand bhi hai, supply bhi hai. <laughs> This is a better way of showing it. It requires two clicks. So now the bottom line is I can't show you 145. You have to learn them. How do you learn them? That is what I'll demonstrate. Create a blank new slide, go to one slide, say insert smart art. Now what will happen? This dialogue will come. You already seen it. Don't go to all. Click on each category, click on each diagram, shows you a bigger version and it shows you how to use it. How to use it as operational detail plus business detail. The first line tells you when to use it. So this is a simple list. Now this is a simple list. This is also a simple list. The difference is this shows level 2 text also. If I just wanted to show departments, I would show this. If I want to write a couple of sentences about a department, I will use this. Now say process. This is a simple linear process. Each task finishes, next starts. If it's parallelism involved, first task is going on, second is still going on. If it is a phase process, phase one task, phase two task. So just look at it, read the first sentence, it requires 25 minutes. Once you do that, your PowerPoint will improve because your brain is smart enough to build that vocabulary. You don't have to buy at anything. Similarly, we use some weird random clip art, stop using it. Better looking slides can now be created by click on icons. There are 900 beautifully created icons available for all of you to use. These are the categories. And these are not like standard clip art. When you resize, they resize beautifully. They are scalable vector graphics, those who understand SVG. Even if you don't understand, it's okay. There are 900 plus icons available. Now, slide layout is very important. Most commonly, what do we do? We create a new slide, create something, then delete this and then work. That is the worst way of working. <laughs> Why do we delete this? So let's say I want to do comparison. I need two text boxes, yes. So now I'll shrink this, manually add, wrong. This is called layout. So open the layout, check, is there a layout? It will work. If there is no layout, for whatever reason, you need three items, then you have to do something different. If you need a custom layout, go to view tab, slide master, and don't modify the original one, duplicate it, give it a better name, and then customize it, and then use it. So if you are noticing that more than thrice you have done the same kind of manual customization, then you need a custom layout. Create a library of custom layout, share it with each other. That's all there is to it. Okay, next we are behind time. Uh, learn all animations. How do you use animation? You click on something, go to animation. There are three types of animation, four types actually. How does the object come into picture? Just a slide, while it is there, does it do something to attract attention? That's called emphasis. While the slide is still there, does it go away? And while it is there, does it move? These are few of them. All of them have more, 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 which nobody clicks on. So the same story. What do you have to do? Go to more. In this case, there is a nice preview option. So all that you have to do is whenever you get bored, click on this diagram. It could be a picture, it could be a text, use both. So, it will tell you how it looks. Just reading the name doesn't tell you how it looks. You have to see it to understand. This you have to do 43 multiplied by 4 number of times. That's absolutely worth your time. Because then, next time the need arises, you will use the correct animation or correct smart art or correct transition in the correct place. And if you want to refine it further, then of course, you can use animation paint. For example, animation pen, I'll just give you one example. This is appear. What does appear mean? It's saying on click, it is going to appear. What does that mean? When I click, this comes. Okay. But I want this to come one word at a time. Then you go to animation pane, double click on it, figure it out. How is it coming? All at once. I want it by word. How much delay between words? 0.5. 
So now what do you do? You still click once, but it will come one word at a time. Like that. So for the refinement. Exactly the same way you understand the animation pane and transitions. Transitions are brilliant if you use the right transition in the right place. Same story, build visual vocabulary. There are some 40 odd transitions. What do you do? You make two slides. One slide and a contrasting slide. Because transition should be used when? When there is a thought transition, contextual transition. Only then you use transitions. You don't use transitions because you like transitions. Never use random transitions. People puke when you do random transition. How do you learn transitions? Two contrasting slides. Click on the second slide. Go to each transition. Click on it and click on the preview button. So now you have your brain will imbibe it. So do this whatever number of times it takes. Don't tell me you don't have time. You have time. And the best transition for this situation I will show you is this. Can anyone tell me the name of the best transition? I don't have prizes to give you, but I'm sure all of us will clap for you. Block. Block. No, not crush. No, not random. Random means you yourself don't know what is going to come. Curtain glorifies things, yeah. Curtain dabai, see, that is what the problem is. If you use a beautiful transition in the wrong place, it looks really sad. <laughs> So the correct transition is this. I will tell you the name later. Do you understand? When you use the correct feature in the correct place, you don't need words. PowerPoint speaks for itself. That is the idea. Okay. Now this is a brilliant new transition called Morph, which of course nobody knows. Uh, everyone knows animation. For example, if I want to move this guy here, I put a line animation and say move from here to here. This is animation. So it will move from, you can control timing and all that. But what I want to do is, I want this shape not only to move here, I want it to rotate, become larger in size and change its color. That animation can't do. So what do I do? I create one slide. This is the base, not this, just the box, no animation. I duplicate the slide and then I will just do it in front of you to show you. This is the same slide right now. In the second slide, I do whatever changes I feel like doing to this guy. So I'm changing the rotation, changing the color, all kinds of things I'm doing. And now if I just show these two slides as it is, it's not going to look nice because it's suddenly going to jump there. I want a smooth in-betweening to be done. Those who understand animation, we have to do in-betweening here. Now that PowerPoint has been giving for six years, nobody knows. So you go to the second slide and click on this beautiful transition called Morph in the second slide. So don't clap. <laughs> now you know this is Microsoft logo. If I want to animate the logo, what do I do? In the previous slide, I have put those four boxes outside. That's all. And then next slide, they are in the right place. So it will animate nicely. If I want to play with it, I can do multiple shots and say they are thinking and then finally they settle down. <laughs> now this works with text as well. So first slide is just ABCD, second slide is the word morph. They have nothing to do with each other. I click on morph and one extra step because by default it applies to shapes, I have to say apply to characters. Now what happens? Sorry, by default, first ABCD and it will find the characters and animate them. So this is a very good thing to explain acronyms. Once you know it, you know how to use it. For example, I want to show inefficiency by sending attachments. I have one file, I send it by mail to four people, then they reply, then I have five files, then I have to copy paste, make the sixth file. Again, they have to know what each other has written. So now 20 copies are floating around. I waste my life like this. My design, and we call this teamwork. <laughs> so now Morph has another one. 
this is a different shape, this is a different shape, they will not morph. So one extra step you have to take, this uh, came one month back, you go to the selection pane and give it a special name. Now suppose I do this, this will not morph, it will just look like fade. So what do I do, I go to selection pane, put double exclamation mark and give it a name, you can change names. And in the second slide, for a different shape, you give the same name. So now this guy understand that this should morph into this. Now see what happens. And of course you have to apply more. And so on. So that is quickly about morph. Okay, 16. Now screen recording is possible. Sometimes we want to teach a software to someone. We want to record the video of explaining some software to people. So you go to insert menu, go to insert menu, media, we know video audio, there is screen recording also. So you can select the area of screen or full screen with recording audio and whatever is going on on the screen. It will get embedded in PowerPoint as a video. Right click on the video and say save as a video, nice and before file. So without buying any software, you can do screen recording and embed it in PowerPoint. Another nice thing you should know is, if you have created a presentation like e-learning, you want to put narration. What do you do? You go to slideshow and say record narration, record slideshow. Now it will go into a different mode and try to do different things. But I will not show you this because it goes into a different mode, but never mind. Now it is actually recording what I am speaking. When I finish the recording, it will come back, the recording will be added, automatically timing will be given to slides and when you finish the presentation and play it, it will automatically run with automatic audio. And going one step further, what will it do? It will actually allow you to create a video from that which will be mp4 file which contains ppt, animation, everything plus the narration, single mp4 file. How do you create that? Go to file, export, export as video and you can choose whatever you want, it even use 4K video. All this is happening in PowerPoint without spending extra money or software. Now when you create a presentation, sometimes we deliver it on another person's laptop and you use some exotic fonts and they completely don't appear there and it's a total chaotic thing. So how do you make sure the fonts you have used go with the presentation very simple file options go to save and this can be done at per presentation embed fonts in file and choose the second option embed all characters this increases file size but even if that special font is not there on the laptop it will work and it will be editable that bullet proofs your presentations okay now Slides, many times we put too much content on slide and read it out. Don't do that, that replaces you, correct? If you are really worried about forgetting things, you can put notes below the slide and then use presenter view. How do you use presenter view? When you are running the slideshow, you right click and say show presenter view. Then what happens? You will see the presenter view, people will see the actual presentation. Now what does presenter view look like? It looks like this shows you the slide, shows you the next slide and it shows you the notes and you navigate from here like that. So you can read your notes, nobody else can see them. Alright, so word, very simple. All of you should know this simple thing called shift enter. Why do I need shift enter? This is a very stupid thing we need but we need it. Now many times we use bullets. Now between this I want to show, type something, about this is good. Now when I press enter a new item comes. I don't want two, I want one only, but I want to describe this guy. Then what do we do? Backspace, backspace, then this ka dunya se uth gaya hai. Phir wala hai nahi hoga, phir marenge, phir pagar milta hai, phir bhi growth nahi hota hai. Why growth is not happening? Because we are wasting time, because we don't know office. So office is a catalyst. Whatever you do, office is not going anywhere. So what do you do? You press shift, enter. 
that's all next correct copy paste very often we copy from somewhere paste somewhere it doesn't work the correct way to copy paste is this for example i want jan feb march to be copied and i want to paste them as bullets in powerpoint what do i do i go to powerpoint yes i go to the correct layout take a new slide this now i don't paste first thought is wrong you have to first tell where whatever the product is where do you want to paste that is why they have written it there click nobody clicks so don't click right click there now it shows you all the different ways in which it can paste it's like a visual what if analysis so choose the correct format copy as usual right click at the destination choose the correct format that is the universal efficient way of copy pasting that's not all go to my blog i have written 21 articles on how to copy paste and i'm still not finished but i got bored please read them okay next normally when we copy something it goes into clipboard if you copy something else the previous clipboard is erased that is stupid when you are doing research you are copying something copying something you want to keep multiple things so how do you get a clipboard by default one clipboard everyone knows this is clipboard nobody look at this guy this is not for decoration it has a purpose so when you click on this insignificant looking thing your life changes significantly this is one clipboard now in another clipboard i am putting another slide notice i am copying that went there now i am going to word and i am copying a paragraph here that also went into that clipboard i can copy from anywhere it will go into that clipboard 24 such things and then i can go wherever i want and choose what i want to paste or i can say paste all also this is brilliant available for 30 years okay next when you want to do anything in word do not do manual formatting manual formatting means you are using word in the worst possible way this is what you do project report you will manually select as a font select as any that is you helping word this is the title you have to make word make it look like a title what is that so open this these are called styles there is already a style called title it will make it look like a title main topic is called heading 1 so there is heading 1 that means main topic okay this is also a main topic heading 1 sub topic is called heading 2 sub sub topic is called heading 3 nine levels are available now what is the benefit of this of course you are not doing formatting but now i have 133 page document i want to navigate in the document i know that i have written something i don't know where i have written i will do find suppose i have a section called cost i will search for cost that is the worst way of going there because the word cost will appear 200 times then we'll say find next find next kitna bar ho bhi nahi malum kitna bar so don't do that now that word knows what is important to you topics and sub topics you want to view the document you want to navigate it nicely that is why there is navigation pane it opens a nice thing here there is a live table of contents so if i want to go to cost in one click i go to cost i don't scroll i don't search it happened to be fine in page 93 i don't care i want to go to fabrication which happened to be 64 and so on and so forth so this is your best friend navigation pane not only that you can collapse this 11 na uh, one na apartment hai na apartment hai to nahi ha so i have multiple levels i can say only show me level 1 now someone says oh demos cannot come after summary i have written 15 pages there i can just reorder them the entire document will get reordered feel miserable about your past <laughs> that is the navigation pane now of course if you really want a formal formal table of contents of course you go there and go wherever you want the table of contents go to references and say give me a table of contents it will create a table of contents 
Sorry, press the wrong key. This is the table of contents. When you make changes, this will get outdated. So, before you send it or finalize it, right click and say update field. That will update the entire table below. That will make sure it is perfect. The next thing we will see is how to use sections. Like PowerPoint, Word also has sections. Here is an example of where you need to use those sections. Look at this document, three pages. Somewhere in the page, I have a table. Now that table is very broad, multiple columns. So I want to make that table in a landscape page. Now when I want to do that, if I just go and make this page landscape, so I go to layout, orientation, landscape, everything becomes landscape. I don't want that. I want this table to own a separate page and make only that page landscape. To do that, even if I put a page before, which is control enter is the shortcut, control enter, and then try to make it landscape, it still doesn't work. All pages become landscape. Why is this happening? Now remember, these corner things are called dialog launchers. You can see the details here. When you say landscape, notice what's happening here. It's just saying whole document. Bottom line, layout cannot be changed for a single page, but it can be changed for something else. It's called section. So what is a section? We go to layout again and say bricks. What we just did was a page break. That is not enough. What we need is a section break. Now, by default, at the bottom, you can see page numbers. In order to see section numbers, right click on the status bar and enable this section. Now we can see that all pages have only one section. That is how Word works. Page cannot remain on its own. It needs a section. So when you create a new document, Word creates one section, then puts one page. Bottom line, all our pages in most documents are just having one section. So anything in this page layout or page setup dialog, actually it cannot be changed per page. It can be changed only at a section level. So what do we need? Before this, I want a new section and a new page. This is only new page. This is new section and new page. So notice now we are on page 3, section 2. Going further, same thing I'll repeat after the table. So now this is section 1. Look at the bottom here. This is section 2 and the purple one onwards is section 3. Now we are good to go. So at this stage, if I go to this particular page, which happens to be in a separate section, and then change the orientation, this page will become landscape. So this is the benefit of using sections. Now, just to show something else, if I write something in this table, or if this table becomes bigger for whatever reason, notice if it has to spill over to another page, that page will continue to be in landscape mode. So it follows wherever it started. Another use of sections is this. Look at this document. I have some paragraphs and a long list of numbers. Now, if I try to keep it like this, many pages uh, or a lot of space is getting wasted. I don't want that. Ideally, I want these numbers to come in columns. Now, how do you get columns? Same thing in the same menu layout. We have columns here. So I'll say three. The problem is, Everything goes into columns. We don't want that. We only want the numbers to be in columns. So as you must have guessed already, for anything to have columns on its own, it must have its own section. So like we did for the table, I'll go here, add a break. And in this case, I don't want a new page to be started when the numbers, there is enough space here. Let the numbers start from here itself. So in this case, I don't want a new page. I want a new section, not a new page. That is called continuous section break. Means put a new section, but don't disturb the page, continue the page. Now nothing seems to have changed. 
but look at this now at the bottom which section this is section 2 when I click in this numbers this is section 1 this is section 2 so section has got created just not visible now the same thing I do at the bottom of those numbers I'll add another continuous section I'll add another continuous section and now this is section 3 now I can click anywhere inside the section and make any number of columns in fact 3 is not enough I can actually make more number of columns so in this case let's try 5 so that is how sections help you in various ways another important use of sections is to have different headers and footers Word has a very nice way of finding more sophisticated stuff. For example, here I have a Word document and in that document I want to search for the word look. How do I do that? I press Ctrl F. Nowadays this dialog comes. If you want the older dialog then you go to advanced find from here. Now I want to search for the word look. When I say find all, what is it going to do? That is how you say find all. It is finding the word look but other parts of other types of word look forms of word look like looks looking it's only searching for the word l double ok it's not searching the full word so these variations of the base word are called word forms and word is very intelligent you can actually choose more and then say find all word forms and then when you say find notice what happens it actually selects the full words even though they are variations of the base word so very very nice and useful feature the next thing we'll see is find text with similar formatting look at this particular document I have uh, some text in red color down below I have some other text in red color now let's say quickly I want to change all the text which is red in color and make it blue in color now the thought which will come to your mind is you'll have to go select each one of them and then go and change the color obviously that's a wrong thought because it's going to be repetitive how many times are you going to do this so you have to think of a different thing we are required to do two things first step is to select all the red things and then to change the color changing the color is easy selecting is the problem so now we have to think it's the global problem because it applies to the whole document global problem solutions are in the menu on top this is an editing related problem all editing commands are in home tab now from that point of view you have to look at the home tab and see where my potential solution could be because I'm trying to select there is a button here called select and here someone has thought of this requirement it's saying select text with similar formatting so make sure you click in the intended format and then go to select say select text with similar formatting and it will do that in one stroke you don't have to worry it's words job and now you can do whatever you want in terms of formatting that is how you use select text with similar formatting now very often when we are working in word especially we have to align things we do the wrong way so if I have say name this is the thing we do for resume after name I want something so I say tab and then say something then I want now this colon is not aligning so when I say tab this colon this colon is not aligning so what do you do you go here and press tab this is the worst way of aligning things tab was practically useful in case of typewriter in today's world you don't need to use tabs so there's a very specific thing you understand the moment you're trying to use tab stop doing it I will tell you how to do it better but consciously notice and prevent use of tabs tabs is there but it is just for backward compatibility not to be used in real life having said that then what do we do 
if there are no tabs to be used then what do we do obviously microsoft has thought about it there is a way to create tables of course you create tables in word as well as powerpoint but in this case we are just thinking about word so i'll show you how to create tables i'm sure you already know how to do it let's say table use i'm sure you know this but what is the practical use in this case now what we wanted to do is name colon name address colon address like that in that context how to use it so i'll say name in the first column then say address here if i really really want colons i'll say colon copy this colon and then i can multi select the entire column and paste so like excel it will do it it'll copy and paste at multiple places now i will type the name so this is address and this is date of birth now just to make it a little complicated i am going to put address in now notice what is going to happen first of all this is not how i want it to look i want this to be nearer no problem but you don't bother about it don't try to drag you go to layout tab and say auto fit to contents if this is what you want keep it if you want to change something because address is probably much longer then it look like this and let's say now what happens i it's all good but i don't want the borders to be seen that is easily done select the table go to in this case design not layout because we are talking about look and feel you say borders and say no border now it still looks like what you would earlier do with tabs but it's much more easily manageable this is how you use tables now when you want to edit this table you may want to see the border of the table right now we are not seeing any borders you don't want to put borders because in printing they should not appear but you want to see them while you are editing for convenience of editing the, the first thought which comes is let me put the borders and remove them later that's not the right way you go to layout and say view grid lines these are temporary these don't get printed of course if you are sending a soft copy and someone opens it they may still see grid lines so remember to shut them off so this is one way of creating table another way of creating table is when you have a more complex requirement we have a brilliant feature let's say this is a table but i want uh, let's say address to be put here i am creating a form which will get printed and someone will write on top of it but here i want more space for the address so i will use this and say merge cells now address is going on two rows so i'll have to select this and again say merge cells this kind of thing we do often where repeatedly we have to do selection merge cells split cells and so on that's not the right way the much better way you create a base table that's okay now you go to layout and notice there is drawing and eraser essentially notice when i select something and merge cells what am i really doing visually i am erasing this border in between the two so you take the eraser now your cursor itself becomes like an eraser now you drag that cursor whatever it touches is erased you have to try it out to believe and understand how powerful and convenient this is you can create very complex tables very quickly using a combination of eraser and drawing as well drawing again looks and behaves in a similar manner just drag it figures it out so that is about creating and drawing tables now when there are tables and you need to fit them i already showed you one part of it but let me show you another one so here we have a table which is going outside the page this happens when we copy paste from excel or some web page where width is much bigger again naturally you are going to manually select something do landscape drag don't do that that's wrong we are not going to help word we are going to ask word to do what we want this is obviously a layout problem and it's fitting 
the table, which is what we want. So open out of it. Earlier we did out of it to contents because the content was small. Here it is not even fitting the page. Page is also called a window. So out of fit to window and the job is done. All right, the next one we will see is repeat header rows. I have a table here and this table is long. It's cutting across pages, but when it goes across pages, the header is not going. So what do I do? Again, the thought process is simple. When there is a problem, think whether it's a local problem or a global problem in the context of the object, in this case, the table. This is a global problem. So now menu has to be on top. There's a layout problem. So look at the layout menu. Look at all the buttons. You'll find the answer. The answer is here. Repeat header rows. Many times this particular menu may not be on because in order for this to be on, your cursor has to be in the first row. Now we can say repeat header rows and in one click it has done the job. Although this is very nice and impressive, this is not exactly what you wanted because actually your header includes this second row. Now I'm going to undo this. Right now there is no header repeating. All right. Now because I want two rows to be in the header, first I select both the rows and then I say repeat header rows. Notice it's not saying repeat header row. It's saying rows, multiple rows. That is the objective. So if you have a long header, no problem. Select both two, three, whatever number of rows and then say repeat header rows. It will work beautifully. Now another nice feature of Word is when you create a table in it, if you put an image inside it, this works and behaves very better, much better than what it would in Excel. In Excel, images are not inside the grid. They are a layer on top of Excel. Whereas if you want to put images in a sort of a table, it's much better to do it in Word. So let's try that. I'm going to add a simple table and I want to put an image here. So when I say insert picture from file, I'll just put some image here. Let me put some small image of clouds. Sometimes the image can be very big. So let me also tell you how that is done. So I'm going to put this image. Notice what happened. It is auto fitting as much as possible this image. Now what is it showing? This is showing the boundary of the image. You can change the size of the image and it will fit fine. You can't do this in Word nor can you do it in PowerPoint. So if you have images and you want to lay them out nicely in a tabular form, Word is the best place to do it. All right. Now, many times we use the same button again and again. For example, I use the format painter very often. Of course, there is a shortcut for it in Word, but format painter in Excel and PowerPoint doesn't have a shortcut. If you have a shortcut, learn that shortcut. That's as easy as probably you didn't notice this shortcut. So shift control C is format painter. Shift control V is pasting the format. This does not work in PowerPoint. So if you go to PowerPoint and there is of course a format painter, but it doesn't have the shortcut. So let's assume there is a button which I use very commonly. As an example, I will take another button called this. This is a very useful button. Many times when you copy paste data from a web page or some other document, a lot of unwanted formatting comes with it. If you want to get rid of the formatting, this is a very useful button. Now, if I have to use this button often, first I have to click the home tab and then I have to click this button. It's a two step process and it doesn't have a shortcut. So if there is a frequently used button, which does not have a shortcut of its own, this is what you do. You right click on the button and say add to quick access toolbar, which is this small little toolbar here. Now it doesn't matter which menu is open. You can have one click access to it, which is good. But going one step further, if you press Alt key, it gets a shortcut. Now Alt 9 is that button. If you go beyond 9, of course, they'll have, let me put one more button and show you. This starts with 0, 9, not 1, 0, because 0 and 9 are near each other. 
on the keyboard. That is why it's a shortcut. If it was 10 or 10, it would not be a shortcut. Never mind. So start using this toolbar. This is called Quick Access Toolbar. If you have a large toolbar like mine in case of PowerPoint here, it doesn't have enough space on top. So what can you do if this is how it is going to look at truncates part of file name also, which is not good. So if your quick access toolbar becomes long, which I'm sure it will, right click on it and say show it below the ribbon. So you get a separate long row for it and it doesn't interfere with the file name. Best of both worlds. Now if you create a toolbar and you want to share it with someone, you right click on it, go to customize toolbar, export it and the other party can import it. That's how you can standardize, create convenient, efficient custom toolbars. This custom toolbar, the quick access toolbar can be created separately or should be created separately over Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook and OneNote. So that is about custom toolbar. Now, how do you add a button to toolbar? From here. But how do you do that? So I'll use 82 first and then I'll show what is 81. Now, one of the methods or uh, easy ways of creating a PowerPoint presentation, let's say I have this document already and I want to present this document to someone. Now, what am I going to do? I'll go to this document. Typically, I'll make one slide for main heading. So I'll have one slide called executive summary, another called scope of work and design prototyping testing will become bullets in that particular thing. Let me get rid of this. Now, how do you create so many slides from a document which already has headings applied? You don't want to copy paste one by one. That is really inefficient. Fortunately, Microsoft has thought of this and there is a nice little button here called send to PowerPoint. Make sure you have used styles, heading one, heading two, heading three. Now, what does it do? It starts PowerPoint and creates a presentation for you. So once I click on this button, it opens PowerPoint and creates a presentation for you. What really happened is only the main titles and subtitles, which is heading one, two, three, four, have been sent to PowerPoint. This is the fastest way of creating a presentation from Word document. Now, of course, because this file was auto created, you have to say enable editing. And the first thing you have to do is just notice that although this is very convenient, these colors have come from Word. So PowerPoint thinks these are manually customized colors. So if you try to change this to another, another type of design, what will happen? These colors will not match. They will hard coded remain this pink color. So before you do anything to this presentation, it's a good idea to get rid of that extraneous formatting which came from Word. So select all, control A, then go to home tab and say reset. That will bring it back to the default PowerPoint template. And when you apply another template to it, or another design to it, it will work fine. That is how you use Word to PowerPoint. Now the biggest question is, and that is why I chose this first and then I will explain this. In my Word document, there is a button called send to PowerPoint. If you check in your particular Word instance, you will not have it. Obviously, you can add it like we added this button called clear formatting. This button I added because it was visible somewhere. I right clicked on it and I added it. Unfortunately, this button called send to PowerPoint is not there anywhere in the menus. So how do we add this? There are lots of such brilliant features which are not visible anywhere on the menu, but they are there. So you right click on the toolbar, go to customize. It shows you a long list of available commands and the list of what you already have added there. So this is what we just added, clear all formatting. Now the command which we are looking for called send to PowerPoint is by no means popular. So we say all commands. Now make sure you press or click the mouse in the list here. That send to PowerPoint is the option somewhere in this very, very long list. 
this is a very long list don't type s e n d depending on the version this s e n d may work or not or finally scroll it and you will find somewhere send to powerpoint once you find it you add it to this i have already added it and that's how you get this that is another way to customize quick access toolbar now another very useful thing which i showed you earlier is this sometimes we want to go to paragraph dialog how do you go to paragraph dialog generally you right click and say paragraph the problem with that approach is if you are inside a table for example what happens in a table let me show you that so if i have a table inside the table i have put some text now if i want to go to the format paragraph there is no format paragraph because now my word is prioritizing the tableness so it is showing you table related menu so here is one nice little thing you should know these in the menu are called groups of commands so these are all the commands related to fonts these are all the commands related to keyboard this is paragraph these are called groups now whenever you see this kind of icon next to a name of a group that means it is going to open the dialog for paragraph this is going to open the dialog for font and so on and so forth so if i click here this is the paragraph dialog this is very useful in excel as well by the way these if you go to these dialogs very often you should and you can add them to quick access toolbar for easy availability in excel very often we have a requirement for going to page setup earlier older version file menu had the page setup dialog but now it doesn't have so when you go to page layout page setup is the group name this is the dialog launcher right click add to quick access toolbar or directly click on it this is the page setup so remember corner buttons lead to something bigger more detailed another example of this is in powerpoint in powerpoint when you select something for example i have selected this this is called shape format now there is a dialog here this when you go it is going to give you all the details about the shape as well as text so sometimes these things open separate dialog sometimes they open a side window called a pane another very useful thing is how to put hyperlinks in any office product when you press control k hyperlink gets added of course in case of office hyperlinks come in two forms one is a traditional hyperlink which could be linked to a particular file or a web page or place in the document in case of powerpoint place in the document shows all the slides in case of word place in the document shows styles which are applied so let's say i am writing something like this now i have written the total cost somewhere down and i want to do a hyperlink so in say control k place in the document now it will give me hyperlinks of all the headings so that is how hyperlink is done it's a very useful feature one of the things you should remember while doing hyperlink is when you add a hyperlink this is the text to be displayed and this is the actual link so this can be changed separately another nice thing is sometimes you don't want a hyperlink for example if i say as soon as i press is going to convert it to a hyperlink you don't want it now what do you do of course you can right click on it say remove hyperlink but as soon as this happens press backspace or undo it will go away so let me try to show it again if this happen you say undo control z it goes away all right the next one is cross reference i already showed you how to cross reference from here to there so what happens in cross reference in fact in references there are lots of ways in which we can cross reference the word document 
Sometimes you need footnotes. That also can be added from here. We can add captions here. We can create an index as well as a bibliography. So one of the things in this is cross-reference. So this is a very sophisticated thing. It allows you to refer from anywhere to anywhere. I don't have time to explain everything to you, but if you're writing a long report or a research paper, cross-referencing is very important. Learn this dialogue. Now, one of the common things you need is I want a uh, similar type of documents to be created very often. How do we do that? So let's say I have a document which is like this. Anytime I send a new proposal for a customer or a project, I start with this. Typically what you do is you'll open an existing file every time, save it as, and then delete unwanted stuff and do it. Once or twice it's okay, but if it's a regular activity, what you do is you create a reusable template. So I deleted the unwanted text from the original file and now I have only the headings. Now this is something I want to start with. Not a blank document, not a filled document. So now what do I do? I go to File, Save As. Make sure you change this from docx to a template, word template, dot x, d-o-t-x, right? Now we recommend another folder. This may or may not come to you because when it's a template, what happens is a template needs to be stored in a particular folder for it to be reusable by you and appear in the file new menu. Right now it's a different menu or different folder. So it's telling you go to the recommended folder. So now notice this is the default folder. You don't have to know about it. Just make sure you put it in the right place. So I'm just calling it proposal 2009 and that's it. Now I'm closing this template. Now how do I reuse it next time? So I go to file, in file I go to new and notice depending on which version you have, you will see your custom templates which you created. This is the one we created just now. And now I can start with a template rather than a blank document. Notice the title or the file name is document three. It's a fresh new document. So that is how templates are used in Word, Excel, as well as PowerPoint. Another very common feature is I need to put some text, which is very frequently used. So in a project, I have written a lot of things and somewhere down the line, I want to write uh, terms and conditions. So I say terms and condition. Now I have already written terms and conditions some other document. I'll open that document, copy paste it from there. That's not a good idea. So what do you do? This is just a demo. If you have terms and conditions or any reusable block of data or text, you select it first time. These are called quick parts, quick parts, explore quick parts. Now in this case, quick part is a collection of some paragraph text, which has to be reusable. So I say save selection to quick part gallery. It picks up the name, you can change it, just click OK. Now I go to another document and I want the same terms and conditions. What do I do? I go to insert, go to quick parts, and now those terms and conditions will appear here. This is how you can create a collection of reusable components and make your life much easier. Similar, similar to this block of data we did, we can actually create customized quick table. So create a table, customize it. Once the table is exactly the way you want, select it and then go to quick tables and say save selection to quick table gallery. Right now it's not active because I don't have a table selected, but it works exactly the same way. In fact, many things in insert menu have galleries like this. So if you have created a custom cover page, that also you can add. Special headers, footers can be added. If you say header footer, again, save selection to 
the gallery and various types of text boxes can be also added. Bottom line, anything you copy paste from an old document more than thrice belongs to one of these quick parts. Over a period of time, you'll create a nice library of reusable content. Not only will it save time, it standardizes things also very quickly. All right, now the next one is whenever we create uh, whenever we create a PowerPoint presentation or Excel or Word, sometime in life we have to use colors. Some colors come automatically, but sometimes we have to select them. How do we do that? Typically we go and choose a color. So this is font. I want to change the font color. I'll use one of the colors. But notice that there are two categories of colors, theme colors and standard colors. So let me explain what is the difference between the two and why we should use which one when. So notice what is happening here. If you are in doubt, always use theme color. That's the idea. So what is theme color? The one on top is called theme color. Notice that there are 10 slots here. Now, if you don't know which one to use, always use theme color. Then when do you use standard color? That is the question. The answer is only when that color usage has a specific meaning. For example, danger has to be written in red color. It can't be written in purple or green color. So this particular red color as a meaning. Now notice what I've done here. In this case, I have gone here and chosen the font color which looks red, which is good. <coughs> oh, sorry. But if I copy this slide and then paste it into another presentation or here itself, I apply a new template. Notice the color is going to change. Why is that going to change? Because when I change the template or copy paste a slide from one PPT to another PPT, essentially what is happening? These 10 colors are changing. So these are called theme colors. So when you apply a color, for example, earlier we had applied color red, but actually PowerPoint doesn't remember the color. It remembers the slot. Number three was applied. That is all it remembers. So when I change the theme, that third slot was occupied by blue color. That's why red changed to blue. So this is by and large a good thing because then if I copy a slide from one PPT to another, it will match the look and feel of the destination presentation. But only in cases where the color has a meaning, you should use standard color. Or of course you need a color. It's not available in theme colors, then you use standard colors. Okay, now Word has a nice feature called Smart Lookup. It's a nice combination of something. So I'm just going to say video and right click Smart Lookup. Now see what happens. It'll do a lot of things. It'll do search. It'll give you a web search right here. It'll give you a definition. It'll give, and give you a pronunciation in case. Video. And it gives you ability to see pictures related to it also. So this is much better than going to a browser and searching for something. So start using it. Another related feature is called thesaurus. And one way to enrich your communication and improve your vocabulary is to know synonyms, antonyms, and use the right word in the right place. So if I want uh, some synonyms, Shift F7 is a very useful key. It'll give you synonyms, give you different context, context of the word, and if relevant, it'll give you antonyms as well. Here it is. So very simple, but get into the habit of using Shift F7. It will improve your vocabulary and will have a positive impact on your communication.
Now, of course, we know what is spelling and grammar, but now in new version of Word, there is a brilliant feature, which is a modified, improved version of spelling and grammar. Here is how it works. All of us know that a red wavy line means spelling mistake. But you see some other stuff as well. This means a grammatical mistake. The word is correct, spelling is correct, but there is some grammatical mistake. How do you know what is the mistake? You just right click on it. Say add comma after fact and done. This one is a very special thing. Actually, quiet, the word quiet has two spellings and we are using the wrong spelling. The spelling is right, but in this context, the spelling is wrong. Why? Because many times people confuse Q-U-I-E-T and Q-U-I-T. In this case, that is the confusion. So apart from grammar, in file, options, proofing, there is a very nice feature called frequently confused words, which is also make sure it's open. This is what is giving you this dialogue. So notice it understands. Now obviously this is again a wrong use. The word is not wrong. The wrong word is used in the wrong place. So it understands. So this is how it allows you to do this. Now what is this dotted line? These are some suggestions. What is it saying? Particular feature. The word particular is not really adding value. Just call it a feature. So it's not a spelling mistake. It's not a grammar mistake. It's just making your text better communicative. This is another one. Different adverbs or remove adverbs. In this case, what were we talking about? Consider using concise language. So it was removing something. In this case, it's not removing, saying, do you want to see especially, extremely, or particularly? Again, improving your vocabulary. So this comes under the category of vocabulary choice. If you don't want to go one by one like this, you go to review and check document and it opens this dialogue. It will actually go through the whole document and give you statistics. This is very sophisticated. Depending on the kind of work you are doing, ideally you should go to settings and look at what settings are available under grammar. This is a very long list. So depending on the business context and what you are doing, you may find some of the options which you really need are actually deactivated, in which case you should enable them. Notice if you are in journalism, this may make a difference. If you are writing something, we may want definitely want to make sure we don't have any of the biases. So look at how much detail is available for you to make sure your communication is the best. The next topic is word researcher. If you write, if you write uh, research papers, reports, review articles, this is really really useful. What does it do? It does very simple. Let's say I'm writing something. And this particular thing they, I have picked up from a reference. So I'm searching for something. I want to put that reference here. Normally, you'll go to the browser page, find the article, then you'll have to manually type it here and then build a bibliography. Instead of that, you go to Review tab and choose Researcher. Sorry, References tab and Researcher. Now it asks you the name of the topic. So I'm just going to call, what does it do? It doesn't do a regular web search. It is actually going to scholarly articles in journals. If you want, it can be website or both. So now notice what is happening. It's giving me all the scientific articles available, published. Now suppose I find a particular thing useful and this is the reference I want to put here. I just select it and create the plus sign. Now notice what happened. It added that reference here because now how the reference is added depends on which type of bibliography you have chosen. If you change it, that will change. So what happens here? Not only that, it actually created a bibliography with the correct citation for this. So this is a brilliant feature which allows you to create citations 
and update an automatic bibliography. Of course, you have to find the correct article from here. Sometimes, depending on the topic which you have, you may want to see more topics. And in some other cases, you may want to search for word or images as well. So you can add images as well as references using Researcher. Start using it. Now, of course, a more sophisticated feature which Researcher did use is to create a bibliography from scratch. How do we do that? As you didn't have this bibliography, you directly go to citations and bibliography. You have gone to a browser page or you have found the article, you have found the reference. Now it's a two step process. You go to references and you go to manage sources. This is a list of all the sources you have already added. Now, how did these sources come here? Because I have used the researcher, it added these sources directly. But suppose you have a new citation, you can go to new and then make a master list of your citations or references. This is really comprehensive. These fields which you see author, title, city, these are the fields being shown because it's a book. If I choose a journal article, these will change. So depending on what it is, let's say website, everything will change. So there's a very comprehensive database. What you do is you create this list. Now, once the list is ready, let's say here I want to put a reference. So now I go to insert citation. It will give you all the things which you have. Now notice there's another thing. Why did it show only three? Because when you say manage sources, this is a master list of all your citations across Word documents. Whereas in this particular document, we only have two. So if you really want all of them to be available to this document, you should not select all because that's generally not required. You choose the one, you choose the one which is not there, but you need it now, close this, and then you can insert citation from whichever it is. So that is how this works. Now, how do you create this bibliography? Earlier in the earlier demo, that bibliography was created automatically by Word because we use the researcher feature. Now here I have just added references. I go to bibliography like table of contents. It has two variations, three variations rather. Concept is exactly the same, only the title differs, bibliography references or works cited. Now bibliography comes automatically. Now this bibliography format is also very important. You see this is the citation and this is the bibliography. These formats are controlled by various standards. There are a lot of standards. If you are writing an article for a particular publication or a website or an institute, ask them which one they want the citation to be in. The best part about Word is you just change it to whatever you want and the entire method of the citation as well as bibliography will change instantly. It's a brilliant feature. I'm sure you will love it and use it. All right, now another very simple but very effective thing in Word. When we have a long document, sometimes we want to zoom out and see how the layout is. Of course, you press Control key and mouse wheel to zoom out. Or you can use this slider at the bottom to zoom out. Now notice by default, in case of Word, it is one page setting. It comes under view. So if you zoom out, it will zoom out, but then so much space on either side is wasted. And you see, why is it like this? Why can't I use the space around those pages? The only thing you have to do is, if this is the way Word is zooming in and zoom out in one page column, you say multiple pages. And then it will work exactly the way you want it. Very simple. But if you don't know it, it's an irritant. Now, this is a very nice new feature. Sometimes we want to ask people to put comments in a document or ask for some advice. 
Of course, we have seen that we should store the documents on OneDrive and send a link to people rather than sending a physical copy. Because if you send a physical copy, you will get another version of that file. You will have to copy paste something in your file, which is tedious. Now, even if I send a link to someone, where exactly do I want the inputs from that person? That is a question. So now notice what I've done. I am assistant. I have put a comment. In the comment, I have said at the rate boss. When you say at the rate in a comment, this is what happens. Let me show you live. So here I select something and I'm saying insert comment, which is here, new comment. Now notice what I'm doing. If I type, of course it can be regular text, but if I press at the rate of, it'll give me a list of people from my organization. And then notice what I'm doing. I'm just typing, but notice what this guy asked you. It's saying you are asking assistant to do something. This file is on your OneDrive. Only you can see it. Do you want me to share? And also send him a mail saying you want some inputs. So you say yes. So that's all there is to it. Now document is automatically shared with assistant. And what will happen that other party will get an email. And what happens when that person does that? When they open the document, it will directly go to that place and open that comment so that the person can give specific inputs in the right place. Of course, you can ask for multiple inputs. So this brilliant integration between OneDrive, Word, and this works exactly the same way in Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. This is a very useful thing. We have a wrong or false sense that when there is a PDF file, you can't edit it unless you have Acrobat, which very few people have. That is not correct. Let's say this is a file. This is a PDF file. Now, this cannot be edited. We know that. But if I want something to be edited in it, what can I do without having PDF? So what do you do? You go to right click and say open with. Now, in my case, I actually have the full version of Adobe. So I'm not seeing the option. But in your case, if you have Office 2016 or more, then you will see Word as an option here. So I'm going to just choose this lengthier way. I'll go to choose another app and more apps. You don't have to do it. Most probably you will see that in the right click open with. But just to show you what happens, it gives you a message saying I'm going to try and interpret what is there in that document. And it does the job. When it does, it takes a little while depending on which, depending on how long and complex the document is. Now, this is the Word version of that PDF. Notice, because it's in Word, everything is editable now. Also, tables are available. It doesn't look like a table right now, but you know what to do. View grid lines. This is a table. So now I can copy paste this into Excel as well. It'll work beautifully. If there's a table in PDF and you copy paste to Excel, it just spoils everything. It doesn't get pasted properly in rows and columns. So this is the way to do it in case you want to copy paste tabular data from PDF to Excel. You have to go through this extra step of editing in Word, then go to Word table, copy paste to Excel. Life is good. Now, Word has many features for find, but let me highlight some of the nice features available here. So let me open the right document. Now, when you press Control F, this appears. This is probably something you know, but there are many nice things here which you should notice. So I'm going to search for the word efficiency. Notice I don't have to press Enter. It actually tells me how many times it has appeared, which is good. And it also shows the sentences which contain that word. Notice when you hover on the sentence, it shows you the page number. This is page 1, this is page 67, this is 102. 
Now in this case, I have created random text, so it is similar. But in your case, looking at the correct sentence, you know where do you want to go. When you click on it, of course, it will go to that instance. That's okay, great. Now that's not all. If you click on pages here, notice what it is showing you. It's not showing you all pages. It's only showing you pages which have that word. Why is this important? Of course, you can't read anything there, but this view is important because although you can't read it, it shows you the density, it means how many times this word has appeared on this page. So here it appears to have twice or thrice. Here it's only once, here it's only once, here it's once. So how does that help you? Wherever the density is more, that means you are covering that topic, you are discussing it, you are explaining it. Wherever it's a single instance, that means you are mentioning it. So looking at the density, you can decide where you want to go. It's very nice. Now another thing, headings. Of course we know what are headings. This is the navigation pane which we saw, which comes because we are using styles. Heading 1, Heading 2. But notice what has happened now. Only the headings in which the word appears are now yellow in color. Now if I click on it, now this particular heading style or this particular topic called environmental may have 10 pages in it. You may or may not see what you are looking for right there. For example, I did go to risk factors, but risk factor has a lot of data. I'll have to scroll here to find out where it is. So especially to go to exact place, this is not very useful. But why is it there then? If the feature is there, it has to have a practical benefit and a use. So think about it. I am searching for the word efficiency. Let's say this was an article or report I was writing about efficiency. What is it basically telling you? It's telling you the coverage of that word or phrase across the document. Now assume this was about efficiency. How could I have not talked about summary? I can't talk about a topic and then not mention it at all in summary. So this gives you an overall picture of the coverage of a concept and allows you to see have you covered it correctly or are there any omissions. These are the three ways of using find. Of course, there is more to it. If you have tables, you can click on a table and it will only find tables. So if I open this drop down and say tables, it will find a table. Again, it is showing you where the tables are. It is showing you the pages on which tables are and so on. And of course, there is nothing to show because table is not cannot be shown as text. But then again, I have a problem. How do I go to the exact place? Of course, I can go on the page, but in the page also I'll have to navigate. So this is what you do. You use this up arrow, you go to the previous table and select it. You go to the previous, previous, next, like that. So it's brilliant and extremely useful. So start using this when you are searching. Now let's move on to the next topic. This is a very simple one. If you want to send, send a file to someone and you want only specific people to see it, you should go to File, Save, and in Info, there is something called Protect Document. And there we say Encrypt with Password, put a password, it will ask you twice and that's it. Although this works, a better way of doing this is put the file on one drive, share it only with that person, that's it. Encrypt is password with an older option where multiple people had access to a folder, but you decided whoever knows the password, only they can edit the file. It's there. Use it if it is relevant. Now this is a nice feature. Maybe you have a shared document. Multiple people are working on this. I have finished this project or this document now. People still can edit it, but I want to discourage inadvertent changes to it. Sometimes I want to read the document, but while reading some keystroke gets pressed by mistake, something is deleted. So I want everyone to know this document is now finalized. So again, go to the same place, info. I still go here and say mark as final. What does that mean? I'll show you. 
once the document is marked as final I'm just going to save it it puts a setting so whenever you or anybody else opens that particular document it will show you this dialog this says it has been marked as final to indicate the document is completed editing this is not a security feature this is not a protection feature it's not going to ask you any password basically it has turned off all kinds of editing so notice if I go to home tab insert tab nothing is available it's telling you it is marked as final this is just to prevent changes by mistake by all means if I genuinely want to edit the document I can say edit it doesn't ask you any password now everything is available so it's just to discourage inadvertent changes now track changes I'm sure all of you know what is track changes if you want others to edit your document but you want to know what they have edited and you want to decide whether to keep their changes or not you use track changes so you go to review enable track changes and now if you type or anybody else types the tracking will happen so if I delete something it will not actually get deleted if I add something it will look like this this thing at the side means some change has happened I can even completely delete something like this again it will show it as delete so this is called track changes what is the correct way of using this enable track changes put the file on one drive share it with someone by link don't send the file now the problem is when that person is editing the file and they realize that track changes is on they can actually or they means the other party can actually stop track changes now what that person is editing is not visible so this could potentially mean people can cheat you like that because when you get the document back you're only going to go here and then you're going to say okay uh, show me what changes happen you'll start from top you'll go to reference uh, sorry review and you'll say accept or decline changes so it'll show you do you want this to be deleted you say yes and say do you want this to be added yes so like that one by one you can decide what to do now in the process if the other party had made some changes without track changes being on you will miss them so when you enable track changes you should do lock tracking and then put a password there's a demo so I'm putting a one character password put a longer password so this is how it allows you to make sure other party cannot disable track changes and this is a foolproof way of using track changes okay that brings us to century 100 now sometimes what happens we have a document and uh, original document you got by mail then you talk to the vendor say no no change something they sent your revised proposal now you have two physically separate documents original and revised now what do you do there is no track changes so you will not know what has changed so this is what you do you go to review tab and there is something called compare when you have documents two separate documents without track changes you go to compare on one side you open the document on another side you open the other document and then click OK once that is done you will see something like this this is the original document this is the revised document this is a combined document this is an independent document it doesn't touch the original or the revised and whatever is the change part it actually shows you here as track changes so this is how without manually doing anything you can compare multiple documents and create a combined version of it with retrospectively put track changes this saves you enormous amount of time start using it another method is if I have multiple people with track changes what do I do I can't use the earlier thing called compare compare is used when you have multiple documents without track changes so I have two documents physically this should not happen in today's world because we are going to share the document on one drive as a link but maybe you have a document which you send by email 
this is what changes boss has made this is the change i made now i have two documents both of them have tracked changes from different people so what do you do this is the menu which i showed you earlier i go to compare and combine combine revisions from multiple authors track changes are called revisions so same thing one side one side and then it will combine that's all there is to it now this is a very simple one i hope many of you will know it but just to show that this is useful so format painter is something where we select something and pick up the format so let me format it in a different way so that we can use it as a source now if i want to have this formatting applied here i go to the source click on format painter now notice the cursor changes with a brush and when i select it this gets applied the problem is this applies only once what if i wanted to apply it to multiple places one after another that's where you double click when you double click what happens now you can continue applying the cursor doesn't change this double click thing he works with highlight also because very often when you are in highlight mode you are highlighting one after another so don't one click once double click and then it remains in highlight mode so one related feature we can use in drawing purpose which is similar to double click but you can't double click there the idea is i want five boxes for example so i'll select a box i'll draw a box but i want five of them i want again to draw a box again to draw a box like that like we did for format painter or highlighting unfortunately double clicking on this doesn't work but that doesn't mean microsoft doesn't know that you need it so if for a shape you want to draw it repeatedly instead of double click you right click and say lock drawing mode now you can draw repeated shapes till you press escape all right now this is just to mention that once you have one drive all of his products can be edited in browser so for example you put a file on one drive you send a link to someone else that someone else doesn't have office doesn't have word installed doesn't have a subscription to a office 365 or one drive no problem they can click on the link open word on browser word or excel or powerpoint and still do the job of course the browser version has lesser features so if you want all the features you use the full version if you want to do quick and easy editing you use the browser version it will work on any platform on any browser it will work on linux browser as well now what has to if you have a long document and you want to read it like a, uh like a like a book book reader the word has reading view so go to the view tab and choose read mode so it looks like an e reader now you can zoom out to whatever convenient thing you want you can even have two pages it has many nice options you can decide the column width if you want to do it like kindle you can have a sepia tone for easy reading this when you scroll the mouse it scrolls horizontally rather than vertically which is what happens in case of word if you have tables you can go to the table and also zoom in when you zoom in notice the word document did not zoom in it zoomed into that particular table there is a further zoom available where you can see it in detail similar thing happens for images when you double click on an image you can zoom it and see it in detail so this is a very convenient way while doing this it gives you more relevant features because if you are reading probably you are going to highlight important things or you are going to put some comments so depending on what you want you can put new comment ink comment means if you have a stylus you can write a comment also why smart look up is here because you want something to be checked on web you can do it from here itself and of course it can translate from some 65 different languages so that is how there is a reading view there is also a focus mode in word which is actually the next topic which is similar to reading view it makes it full screen 
and removes all distraction. This view you can even write, but you don't see any menus. Just focuses your attention and eliminates all other distractions. Press escape to come out. Okay, going further. Now, as you are realizing, office products are something we are going to use very often in our life. So, because we have to open these applications every day, so many times, it's a good idea to pin them to the taskbar. How does one pin them? Let me unpin and then show you how to pin. So, I'm just going to close the window and unpin. Now, I'm going to start Outlook. Typically, how will you start Outlook? You'll go to Start Menu, type you, type it or look at the icon somehow and find Outlook. Now, okay, first time you do that, that's fine. But that's not something you would want to do if you open this 20 times a day. So once it opens, what happens? You right click on it and say Pin to Taskbar. Now what happens? I'm closing one Outlook. Still the icon remains, you click on it, in one click it will start. So all commonly used tools, not just Office, should be pinned. Now, other than that, there is one more thing you can do. If you right click on the files, notice the files which I have recently opened are also available here. So if I wanted to start PowerPoint, of course I could have clicked on this icon, but I wanted to start PowerPoint and open a recent file, I could have done it in one right click, choose the file. So even if PowerPoint is not open, it will open and open that file. Now going one step further, this list is going to get, this list is going to be variable. As more files are opened, the lowest ones will get removed. But if I want to repeatedly open a file because I use it frequently, then this is a pin. If you click this pin, for example, efficiency crash course, now it goes in the pinned one. This will never go away unless I unpin it and then it dies its natural course. So that is pinning the icon to taskbar and pinning files to the taskbar list. This is called a jump list. That's not all. When you go to file open, again you see a list of recent files. Also notice you get a list of recent folders. Again all of them have a pin. So there are so many ways Microsoft is trying to make it convenient for you to get access to the commonly used folders and files. So whenever you see a pin, think, do I need to pin this document or folder? It will become a habit. This is a concept which I have already mentioned, but just to illustrate the concept of this, many things in Office are visual. And we have seen that there were some 40 plus transitions, 100 plus animations. Each animation has a name, each transition has a name, but reading the name doesn't tell you what it does. That is why we have to see it to learn it. That is what I call visual vocabulary. Now generally when there is something like that, there is a gallery, multiple options available. We don't go and look at all of them. That's the problem. When you see a collection of something visual, it is in your interest to build that vocabulary by seeing it just once and then you can shortlist the best use for it. To give you one example, I'll insert a picture here. And now in this picture, what is happening? I have picture format and I have picture styles. Now, if I open this drop down, you'll see there are a lot of picture styles. I need to visually understand them so that I will use the right one in the right place. To do that, make sure this drop down doesn't overlap the picture, then you can't see the picture, how it looks. So just I'm going to make the picture a little smaller. So without interfering with this, I can see it. Now, all that you have to do is go to each one of them and see how it looks. You don't have to click on it, you just notice it. Once you have seen it in action, then next time you have a picture and you want to make it a little enhanced, you have to think which method should I use to make this picture look better. 
in my presentation you will already have noticed that whenever there is a whenever there is a screenshot i have used a particular style for it notice this has a shadow let me show you what happens if there was no shadow there notice it looks flat and uninteresting by just going to the same dialog this case this was the best way to enhance the picture that is how you use it to your advantage okay let's go to the next one next one is very simple this is a very simple technique of checking whatever you are doing is it efficient or inefficient if you notice that you are using hands using hands using hands not using brain that means your method is wrong or inefficient you may achieve the end result but it is wasting your time another thought which i already mentioned so many times is who is helping whom if you feel you are helping the software stop doing it there must be a better way you just have to find it how do you find a better way again i have told you so many simple examples first thing is to start noticing all buttons just read their names if you don't understand anything hover for one second there keep your mouse cursor there It'll tell you what it does you don't have to click on each one of them just notice them then if you specifically want to know something i already told you what to do think is it a global problem then choose the correct menu on the top you will find the answer there if it's a localized problem right click read all the menu options and you will find the answer and you will find the answer so that's all there is to it this is how easy it is to learn but doing consistently is going to make you super efficient and this is something probably many of you don't even know it exists what is a password manager password manager is a software which typically works on your desktop as well as mobiles and manages your passwords it is very important in today's world to use a password manager typically what we do is we think i will remember all the passwords which is actually difficult to do so we do one of the two bad things either we use the same password multiple places which is a risk or we write down those passwords in a word file or a powerpoint file and then put a password to that file that is also easily broken and if that file password is broken all your passwords are exposed so none of the methods which we use routinely are protecting your passwords and in today's world the risks are increasing exponentially so these are the password managers available many of them have a free version so start using them it's very important for security purpose i don't have time to explain exactly what the password manager does but um basically it imports all your passwords or you can put all your passwords there it helps you generate complex passwords and remember them once you at once it has remembered all the passwords it also automatically can go and change the passwords at periodic intervals so once you let the password management software manage your passwords you have to remember only one master password the password for that password manager and that's it life becomes much more secure personally i use last pass now i'm not going to demonstrate this but again authentication or logging in anywhere is very critical so if you use windows 10 please use windows pin windows pin is just a four digit number but it is more secure than a typical password of 18 characters don't ask me why read it up if you have a laptop with a camera which supports face recognition then you can use windows hello as well where you just sit in front of the laptop it recognizes you and unlocks it whatever it is always try to use a two factor authentication password plus otp kind of thing this is a very simple but very useful thing to understand whenever you are using something in word excel or powerpoint if you drag something something happens for example if i type a number and drag it something happens okay it's going to repeat 111 now generally you don't want that you want it serial numbers to be there 
So what happened? If I right drag, it is giving me options. By default, it does copy cell. So you wanted fill series, no problem. So this is just a small example. The idea is whenever you drag, the default action happens. But that doesn't mean that's the only action possible. You want something else, no problem. You can right drag, means press the right mouse button and then drag. That is how it works. Very simple, but very effective. It'll help you learn new things instantly. This is just a shortcut you should remember. Everyone knows Control C means copy and Control V means paste. But very often we go to paste special. For paste special, typically what do you have to do? Assume I have copied, then I have to go to paste and paste special. So remember the shortcut for it. Control V is for paste. Shift Control V is for paste special. That's all. Now that brings us to another topic. How do I learn shortcuts? There are hundreds of them and there's absolutely no need for you to learn all of them. How do you decide which shortcut to learn? That is the more important topic. So you have to start noticing continuously which buttons you are using more commonly. So if you are using a particular button commonly, like I just showed you, there is a shortcut or not. Go and check. How do you know is that that button has a shortcut? Just stay on the button. Don't click. It will tell you in the tooltip if there is a shortcut. For example, new slide has a shortcut called Control M. Maybe you didn't notice it because you always go and quickly click on new slide. So notice frequently used buttons and next time you go there, don't click. Wait for a second and check. Is there a shortcut? If it is, you will learn it in few days. Now if there is a, some button which you use often, but it does not have a shortcut, then that's a problem. For example, in Excel, wrap text is very commonly used, but it doesn't have a shortcut. Then you already know what to do. Right click and add to quick access toolbar. That's how you create a toolbar entry for it. So now I can do it from here or I can do it from here or I have actually a keyboard shortcut called Alt 6. So notice commonly used buttons and then we'll check whether there is a shortcut. If not, add them to quick access toolbar. This is something which I can't demonstrate, but it's really important. Even though there is voice becoming a major input methodology today, typing is not going anywhere for at least few years to come. But the problem is most people have never learned typing the right way. Please invest your time and energy on a learning typing tutor. There are hundreds of free typing tutor software available online. Spend 15 minutes a day. Initially, your fingers will pain, but later on, it is an enormous amount of benefit. What is the benefit? We are not really talking about time saving or the time you waste in correcting mistakes. Today, subconsciously, because you don't know typing, whatever you are typing, some amount of your mental energy is getting wasted in groping for keys your concentration level is less. Once you know typing subconsciously and you get good at it, it lets your thoughts express themselves better. Whatever you do, the output quality will be better. So learn typing and life will be better. Especially if you type a lot of text. Even for numbers, if you do a lot of data related stuff, no problem. Typing tutors have separate coaching for the numeric keypad as well. This is an ergonomic thing from point of view of health. Very often laptops have only the touchpad. Laptop doesn't give you a mouse free. But please use mouse because mouse is better for your wrist. Touchpad will initiate arthritis and carpal tunnel syndrome very, very quickly. If there is no mouse available once in a while, using touchpad is okay. But by default, invest in a mouse. It's not a big investment. You get mouse for, I think, 150 bucks as well. But buy a good one. You need not go for a, a jazzy wireless one also. Wired is also good enough. Having a mouse and not having a mouse is a huge difference. Which kind of mouse is not very significant. Now, whatever I have shown so far, we have seen a lot of products. Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote, 
plus OneDrive. All these applications are available as mobile apps. Install them so that your files are available and editable on mobile as well. Of course, on mobile, it's limited the amount of screen as well as limited capability, but still the mobile apps are quite usable even from editing point of view. Now, many of you may be using Google Docs or equivalent application from Apple or some other and you may think, why should I go for office? I'm already having some method to make a spreadsheet, some method to make uh, presentations and some documentation. That may be true, but I think I don't have to convince you that Microsoft is way ahead of all of them. Probably you didn't know that earlier, but now I have just shown you 118 things about these products. That's not all. There are 12,600 useful features in these products. So if you have not already understood it, you can go and compare what features are available here, what features are available on others. There is no dispute whether you should use this or not. If you really want to be productive in life, you need to use Microsoft Office. Not because I am liking it, because other products are absolutely nowhere near there. And if you don't have the relevant features, you will waste more time doing the same job. That is why Microsoft Office is a catalyst to your growth. And finally, the thing is, not only should you use Office, but you should use the latest version of Office. Yes, I know you are learning and you can't invest too much, but I'm not asking you for much. You go to office.com, make sure it's an India country site. Office 365 Home is available for just 5,200 per year. That is 530 per month, which is one pizza or one small party. Not only that, it's not one person who can use it. The biggest, best part of this is for up to six people, that means six laptops or desktops, all that is costing 530. So per instance or per copy, it's actually 100 bucks per month, which is nothing. But even that is not enough. What you get is one terabyte of OneDrive space for one year. So it's an absolute steal. Don't delete the decision, buy it now. Because you are in the process of learning, you should have the best infrastructure possible. So that's it. Uh, that's all I have time for. Thank you for your patience.